how deeply moved I am today because now where we live in Puerto Rico, where we have our home, is the Roberto Clemente Street. It can be more fitting, Pirate City, his other home, to have also Roberto Clemente name on his road. So thank you so much, everyone who got behind this, the Pirates always, for keeping us part of the family. And um, Manatee, you know, you have a very special place in our hearts. Thanks and God bless everyone. Thank you both and thank you for being here representing your father's legacy. It means so much to everybody. So the moment is here, the moment we've come for. And what we'd like to do right now is we'd like to unveil Right behind you all right here, the Robert, Roberto Clemente Memorial Way here at Pirate City. And what we'd have to do... Oh. I know this is kind of off the, off the record, but what we'd like to do is we'd like to present the family with the same, uh, with the same replica sign for the family. And then what I'd like to do also is that the pirate organization could come up also. Come up. I wish I could work for you. Come on, sir. Yeah. Steve, get in here. And what we're gonna do, we'll take a picture up front of everybody yeah. when we get done. Steve, Steve come over up. here. Over here. Right. Why don't you go on the other side? Over here. What I do is we'd like to give also the same sign to the pirate organization. The pirate organization. And then what we would like to do is like to call up all the commissioners, city and for the county. And we're going to have one that we actually get to display, and we'll get one to the city also. So I think we all just move up front here, Great. throw pictures and everything, move up front. I'm kind of, yeah. we're improvising. <laughs> Put you guys in the middle. Hey, Roberto, you want to at least get in the middle. Oh, oh. oh. Charlie, oh. you hear that? Wow. The fire to hiring, Elliot. <laughs>
Good afternoon, everyone. It is another wonderful, beautiful day here in Manatee County. I'd like to call to order the Board of County Commissioners land use meeting for Thursday, March 21st to order. Before I, uh, we have the invocation and the Pledge of Allegiance, I would like to just to uh, congratulate Commissioner Amanda Ballard and her husband David on the birth of their uh, bouncing baby boy, Barrett Joseph Ballard. 14 pounds, oh, oh, sorry, not 14 pounds. <laughs> Woo! Five pounds, 14 ounces. <laughs> She's going to shoot me. I know she's watching. She's going to kill me. I'm sure my phone's going to blow up here in a minute, but, but it's so great. I'm so happy for them on the birth of their third child. So we wish them the best of luck and congratulations. So moving forward, what I'd like to do is ask Commissioner James Satcher to say the invocation. If you please rise, remain standing for the pledge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. At the risk of bringing too much gravitas to the situation here at a local meeting. Nevertheless, um, I want to read and borrow some words from George Washington as we pray. Bow your heads. Almighty God, we make our earnest prayer that thou wilt keep the United States in thy holy protection, that thou wilt incline the hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit of subordination and obedience to government and entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another and for their fellow citizens of the United States at large. And finally, that thou wilt most graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice, to love mercy, and to demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and pacific temper of mind, which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion without a humble imitation, of whose example in these things we can never hope to be a happy nation. Grant our supplication, we beseech thee, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. I'd like to ask Marine Corps veteran, combat veteran, and my Marine brother, Jace, Commissioner Jason Bearden, to do the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you both. Thank you, gentlemen. I know it's a little different land use meeting having it at 1.30 in the afternoon, but we were also celebrating today our Employee Recognition Day, and we recognize all of our employees here at the county that um, between five and 35 years of service. So we appreciate all of our employees here at the county, and they keep the wheels on the machine, as we so call it. Um, we do have a time certain out item, but Ms. Knapp, can you announce any changes to the agenda, please? Yes, good afternoon, Commissioners. The only change that I was going to share was the 145 time certain item number 14, hiring of the new county attorney. Other items have all been updated in the uh, agenda system. All right, thank you very much. Are there any requests by any of the commissioners to pull any items from the consent agenda? Okay, thank you. We'll do right now, we're gonna, um, we have a Port Authority meeting uh, coming up, so I will I will recess the land use meeting and we'll pass the gavel to Commissioner Van Onsebridge, who is chair of the port. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and we will open today's port authority meeting. Um, we only have one agenda item, so what we'll do is we'll open up with public comment. Is there anyone from the public who would like to come forward to address the port authority on any of the items on today's agenda? Any of the consent items on today's agenda? All right, not seeing anyone coming forward for public comment. We'll close public comment, we'll move on to consent, and verbally I'm entertaining motions for the consent agenda. Motion so, approved. Second. Motion to approve by Commissioner Cruz, seconded by Commissioner Bearden. We'll do a verbal vote. All in favor of passing consent, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Madam Clerk, consent passes unanimously by a vote of six to zero with Port Authority member Ballard absent. My attorney is freaking out is what I'm told. Uh, yes. We'll uh, then go to Executive Director comments, and since Carlos is not here, we'll turn it over to Dave Sanford. Yes. Sir? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, board members. Uh, we would ask, uh, I, I guess in reverse here, that agenda item 3G, uh, uh, the uh, rise and lease, uh, be pulled and postponed until the April meeting. Well, you're going to have to speak up a little quicker, Dave. I move fast. All right. So... Item G, then, we will 
Well, Madam Attorney, why don't you come forward, please? Since we have already passed consent, how do you want me to amend this? You could do a, a motion to reconsider and then <clears throat> the, the item of the consent agenda, the approval of the consent agenda as a whole, and then take it anew. Okay. We'll entertain motions to reconsider the vote on the consent agenda. So moved. So Second. motion by Commissioner Ron, seconded by Commissioner Turner. We'll now conduct a vote on reconsidering the consent agenda vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? All right. Consent agenda has been reconsidered. We'll now entertain motions to pass consent excluding item G. So moved. Second. Motion by Ron, second by Turner. Do a verbal vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Madam Clerk, it passes unanimously by a vote of six to zero with member Ballard absent. So then we'll move for motions to table item G. Do you have a time certain that you'd like to table it to, Mr. Sanford? Uh, the April meeting. To the April meeting. Do you have a date for the April meeting? Uh, we haven't set it yet. It, it really depends upon how we uh, schedule so, it. So we'll entertain motions to continue item G on consent to an April meeting to be determined. All right. Salute. We have a motion by Commissioner Ron, seconded by Commissioner Turner. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Madam Clerk, that passes unanimously by a vote of six to zero with Port Member Ballard absent. Executive Director, comments? Uh, I have none, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Um, any Commissioner or Port Authority member comments? All right. Seeing none, we're adjourned. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. We're back to the Board of County Commissioner land use meeting. So we're going to move forward with citizen comment. This is citizen comment that's on future agenda items. The total time limit is 30 minutes. We will be stopping for our time certain item at 145. And um, when you come to speak, please uh, state your name and your county of residence. And you will have three minutes at the dais. Um, anybody? On to speak. Hang on. All right. First up is Brenda Jabro. No, I'm not speaking. You're not speaking? Okay, you're waved. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Next up is Captain Thomas Carter. Hello, sir. My name is Thomas Carter, uh, Manatee County. On this roundabout project in uh, Creekwood, well, the first store to close is Applebee's. Thank you. But the land acquisition sent a letter out saying they claimed that in a time frame they had 32 crashes and nobody dying. But the Florida State Police Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles for the same time but until today, 36 calls for uh, service went out and 19 crashes. So we have a little... Um, the reports are not the same. They also claim that traffic uh, from southbound, um, that it will slow traffic on southbound to the roundabout. Well, that's not true because there is a downhill approaching the roundabout. It will cause everybody to go faster, so you use rumble strips to slow traffic. They claim to have under 5,000 vehicles. That's because, well, there's a shopping mall there and people want to shop. But for a roundabout, you must use taxpayer money. You must abide by the DOT regulations that state the amount of traffic for a roundabout. Under 5,000 vehicles will not justify the use of taxpayer money for a roundabout. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, sir. Um, what you had read, you have to, we need you to give that to the clerk. And she can, have you already given her a copy of it? Okay, we'll continue on. Um, is there anyone else that would like to come uh, for public comment on any of future agenda item? All right, we'll go ahead and close a citizen comment on future agenda item. Is there any, now next up would be citizens comment on consent agenda items only. <coughs> is there any citizen that would like to come forward and speak to a consent agenda item? 
Seeing none, we'll go ahead and close this and comment on consent agenda. And I will look for an approval, uh, a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda. I'll make a motion, but I did want to say something about consent. Yes, sir. It, it was more broad for, for everyone. This, this, I, I know we have a lot today. It's a half day, so we put some stuff on consent. But I would encourage people to go look at some of that. There's some really cool stuff on consent here. It's, it's kind of... It would have been nice to present it, but it wasn't necessary. But you know, we have the SRQ observation deck. People ask me about it. That's real. That's a really cool opportunity of something we're doing. That's that's park and usable uh, for Mantia. When I was a little kid, we used to go watch the airplanes take off. I would encourage. I think Bradenton Herald just put an article today or yesterday in the paper about. It. I mean, it's it's really nice. And Commissioner Ballard, who's not here, pushed for the bookmobile. Uh, pretty much since the day she got on the board, we're authorizing actually acquiring it and starting that process. So there's some, some good neighborhood things on this consent that, you know, unfortunately we're not going through them one by one for everyone to see, but the information is online. I'd encourage you to look at it or reach out to one of us because there's some, some pretty positive things on the consent today. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your comment and your motion. Can I get a second <coughs> on consent? Thank you. We have a motion by Commissioner Cruz, a second by Commissioner Turner. Will you please cast your votes now? All right. The motion to approve consent carries six to zero with Commissioner Ballard absent. All right, we're gonna move on to uh, advertised public hearings. Madam Clerk, would you mind swearing in anyone that would like to speak today before the commission? Anyone that is going to speak about anything at all, if you think you're going to hit about speaking today, um, please stand. Else, you get up here, we'll have to swear you in, and everybody will stare at you. Um, go ahead, Madam Clerk. All right. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Thank you, everyone. First up is advertised public hearings, uh, uh, presentations upon request. Is there any item that the board, well, let's go through the items. We've got to swear everybody in. Um, Ms. Knapp, can you go ahead and read um, item number eight into the record, please? Item number eight is SSP 2303, resolution 24053. It's East County K-8 through prototype school site plan. This is a resolution of the Board of County Commissioners allowing for the construction of a school serving kindergarten through eighth grade in the mixed use community activity center level one future land use category, making a determination of consistency with the comprehensive plan for a school site plan, which consists of just over 227,000 square foot K through eight public school facility, just over a 24,000 square foot gym and related infrastructure, all on approved 40 acres within the A uh, general agricultural zoning district and generally located at uh, 12 to 10 Academic Avenue in Manatee County. All right, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Is there any commissioners would like to pull this for presentation? All right. See that I'd like to open this up for any public comment. Is there any public comment regarding item number eight? Thank you very much. I'll close public comment. If we have, oh, we already have a motion made by Commissioner Turner to approve. Second by Commissioner Bearden. Everyone cast their votes now. Okay. It's got you abstaining. <laughs> okay. The motion carries six to zero to six to zero with Commissioner Ballard absent. Ms. Snap, can you read item number nine into the record, please? Item number nine is SSP twenty three zero one resolution twenty four zero five two North County Middle School School Site Plan. This too is a resolution of the Board of County Commissioners allowing for the construction of a middle school in the UF3 future land use category, making a determination of consistency with the comprehensive plan for a school site plan, which includes just over 163,000 square foot middle school facility with a 2,600 square foot chiller yard maintenance building, 6,500 square foot covered play area, 4,500 square foot support buildings and related infrastructure, all on approximately 30 acres within the planned development mixed use zoning district and generally located within the Havel Farms development. Uh, for all of these schools, eight through 11, if you need a staff presenter, uh, Charles Andrews is here for you. All right, thank you, ma'am. Would any commissioners like to pull this for presentation? I see one. All right, thank you very much. 
I'd like to open up item number nine for any public comment. Is there any public comment on number nine? Seeing none, thank you very much. I'll look for a motion. The motion was made by Commissioner Cruz, a second by Commissioner Turner to approve. You can cast your votes now. And the motion carries six to zero with Commissioner Ballard absent. Snap, can you read item number 10? Item number 10, school, uh, SSP 2302, resolution 24054, MTC shooting range school site plan. Again, a resolution of the Board of County Commissioners allowing for the construction of a law enforcement training facility in the Ag Rural Future Land Use category, making a determination of consistency with the comprehensive plan for a school site plan, which includes a 3,400 square foot range house with a 1,600 square foot canopy area, 1,000 square foot shoot house, firing ranges, and driver awareness pad and related infrastructure, all on approximately 25 acres of land located in the extraction zoning district, generally located off Taylor Road. Um, and again, your staff presenter, if you need one, is Charles Andrews. All right, thank you very much. Would any commissioners like a presentation? All right, seeing none. What I do is like to ask for public comment. Would anyone like to come and speak on item number 10? Please come down, state your name and your county of residence, and you have three minutes. How's it going, guys? Um, Cameron, uh, Manatee County. What's your last name, Cameron? Southworth. All right, thank you. Um, I represent a trust that owns the land immediately contiguous to the planned um, facility. Uh, we are the property just south of it. Um, the land previously was an operating orange grove. Uh, we've recently purchased that land and we use it for recreation. Um, its main value to the trust is for a hunting and recreational property. Um, obviously having a facility and additional traffic uh, would, at this point, would just alter wildlife. Uh, also, you know, just kind of the noise that was generated from the range and especially the driving facility uh, could potentially uh, affect wildlife. In addition, we do have quite a bit of uh, agriculture out there. I mean, we're operating cattle on the property. Um, there's people in and out of it constantly to include myself, my family, and um, several young children. Uh, I'm sure uh, being a uh, police facility, safety would not be kind of my main concern. It's just more kind of the, the noise increase, um, the, the shooting, obviously, um, the amount of traffic on that road. A lot of its value is in the, place, the, the point that it's a rural property. It's on a dirt road. Uh, that road itself uh, doesn't tolerate a ton of traffic before it can get uh, pretty well torn up. Um, the increase in traffic is obviously a concern. That's all I got. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, are you, uh, sir, are you coming up to speak? Yes. All right, thank you, sir. Please state your name, county residence, and you have been sworn. George Southworth. I live in Hernando County most of, some of the time. I live in Manatee County. And you have been sworn, sir. Sir? You have been sworn, correct? I have been sworn. Thank you, sir. All right. I own the property at 38820 Taylor Road that is just on the other side of the trust property. Okay, I purchased that ranch in 2016 from the Baden family who are operating it as a shooting training facility. It, was, it received a tremendous amount of objection from everyone in the surrounding neighborhood. The property was put under court order and I actually purchased it from the court to prevent it from being used as a shooting range. Now you're proposing to go approximately 500 feet to the north and put in a shooting range. You have one square mile of property there, 653 acres. There's plenty of room to the north of this on the north end of that property or the north central area of that property where this could be located. All right, it would, be, it would be close to what's mostly just farmland with no residences. Taylor Road has a number of residents. No one out there wants to have this noise and constant shooting going on. 
Nobody wants the traffic on Taylor Road. Originally, you thought you could get an easement through Faulkner. That failed. So now all the traffic's going to be coming down Taylor Road, which is a county-maintained dirt road that is just a little bit of rain and a little bit of traffic, and it's nothing but ruts and a mess. All right, this is an inappropriate use of this property in a rural agricultural quiet community, and I think it's ridiculous for you guys to put it on the extreme south edge of that property when it could be located out in the center of it where it would have a lot less disruption for all of the residents, and in particular, my use. I bought this as a rural agricultural property, eliminated the shooting training that was going on the facility, and now you're going to move it right back. It's a poor use of the property. I can't imagine it's in compliance with your land use. Why, you're building a basically an industrial type facility on rural agricultural land. Has this been rezoned to allow for building construction? I don't, I wouldn't be able to build anything on my property except for maybe a pole barn without having rezoning, building permits, and everything else in place. I don't understand how this shooting facility is going to exist legally on this property. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Would anyone else like to come forward and speak to this item? I think what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and open this item up and have the applicant uh, come forward and speak to the and speak to the matter. Yes, sir. Please state your name, county residence, and you have been sworn. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. I'm Mike Penley. I'm the executive planner for the school district of Manatee County. I have been sworn. I'm a Manatee County resident. Uh, we have a brief PowerPoint presentation for you today. And with me today, I have uh, Joe Rinaldi, who's the Deputy Superintendent of Operations, Reggie Goff, the uh, Interim Director of Construction Services for the school district, as well as James Hogglestone with Folly Bryant Architects and Walter Go of uh, ZNS Engineering. We're here, uh, sorry, we're here today to ask for approval for the MTC shooting range uh, school site plan, which is SSP 2302. Uh, this site, I want to I start by giving you some characteristics of the site and surrounding area, then we'll get into the site plan and then a, a quick overview of how it complies with the comprehensive plan. So the project acreage that we're addressing today is 24.78 acres, so roughly 25 acres. I will tell you that uh, the school district has entered into a lease agreement with the city of Bradenton for 70 acres because your zoning code requires a minimum of 70 acres. As the uh, prior gentleman stated, the city of Bradenton owns 653 acres adjacent to this site. So uh, we are located in the south central portion of it. There is currently no address for this parcel. It's just listed in, on the property appraiser database as Taylor Road, but it is in Mayaka City. Uh, it's generally about a mile east of Wachula Road and about four and a half miles south of State Road 64. The uh, use that we're proposing, as uh, Ms. Knapp told you, is a law enforcement training facility. It will include a 3,487 square foot range building. That building will include one classroom. It will include restrooms, a small kitchen or break area, gun cleaning room, and some storage areas. There'll be a simulated shoot house of 1,000 square feet where non-live ammo is, uh, live, am live ammunition is not used, sorry. Uh, about 1,665 square feet of outdoor canopy area for uh, attendees to sit under while to get out of the, uh, the elements. And there'll also be a 300 by 600 foot driving pad uh, that is required for Florida law, uh, law enforcement training. Uh, the capacity of this classroom is 25 students. That's about the average of what uh, MTC, uh, the Law Enforcement Academy, averages. And the property is currently in the Ag Rural Future Land Use category and is zoned extraction. Uh, some of the, the uh, parameters of your land development code are that we're only allowed two stories. What we're pro proposing is one story. We, we're required to provide a maximum floor area ratio of 0.23 because we have such a small footprint on a large lot. 
uh, our FAR is actually 0 .004. You don't have an open space requirement in this district, but if you did, I would tell you that we're well above 95% because, again, we have a very small footprint on a large lot. We're in flood zones A and X. Sorry, Mr. Penley, I hate to interrupt you, but we have a time certain item and we're five, 10 minutes past it. So what I'd like to do, and I'll bring you right back up. Okay. When we get through our time certain item. Fair enough. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Penley. Um, we'll go right back to that. Our time certain item is item number 14, which is the hiring of, our, of a new county attorney. Um, so, and Mr. Clegg had re resigned and retired. So what I'd like to do is, um, I guess we'll have discussion with regards to hiring the new county attorney. Um, we had several, app we had about 13 applicants apply. Uh, we had, um, and we've um, had, the board had instructed me to start negotiations, um, contract negotiations with uh, Pamela DiStagatino. And um, we've come to a, a point now where we have a contract to present to hire her as our county attorney. Um, so what I think we do now is open it up for any discussion with regards to um, <coughs> hiring Pamela D'Agostino as our county attorney. Anyone, any discussion? Just go on the board, just let me know you're on the board. No, I'm on the board. Okay, thank you, George. Yeah, no, I reviewed the, the contract. We, we need a county attorney. Uh, we did get 13 people, uh, whether it be applicant or, or direct. Pam was by far the best option. There's a supply demand issue relative to competent county attorney opportunities here in Manatee County. Uh, there's a lot of very specific things you need to know about Florida statute, about local laws and procedures and how we've done things. Pam is the, the one who, who fits the bill and uh, she was the, by far the best option. So I think this contract is commensurate with the uh, demand we have for this position and what Pam brings to it. So I'm fully in favor of, of this contract and moving forward to hire Pam Diasino for our county attorney going forward. Okay. There was a motion uh, by Commissioner Cruz. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you very much. Uh, before we vote, I'd also like to say that um, I had great, uh, a lot of conversations with uh, Mrs. DiStagatino and, you know, uh, she comes, she was already part of the family one time. And we appreciate her um, the knowledge she has. The staff already knows her. She's going to step right in and do a great job. So I'm looking forward to, if the vote passes, I'm looking forward to working with her as our county attorney. There was a motion by Commissioner Cruz, a second by Commissioner Turner, uh, Commissioner Turner of hiring the new county attorney, uh, Pamela D. D. Sagatino. Here. Yes, ma'am. Right, sure. Make sure we have the motion, which is written out here. The motion to authorize the chair to execute the county attorney appointment mm -hmm. agreement and into the record with Pamela DiGostino. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So move, second. second. All right, thank you. Thank you, county attorney. Um, if you'd cast your votes now. Huh? Oh, sorry. Can we have, uh, is there anybody that have any public comment regarding this item of a hiring of our new county attorney? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close public comment. If you could cast your votes now. And the motion carries six to zero with Commissioner Ballard being absent. Congratulations. Do you like to come, come forward and say anything? Sorry to the school board people here today. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Um, how ironic. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate the unanimous support of the board, although um, Vice Chair is, um, Ballard is absent today. I look forward to working with all of you and helping the good citizens and representing this, this great county. Thank you. Welcome aboard, our gain. Uh, thank but you very much. The advice of council, she kept that short. I know, I like that. <laughs> I like those county attorneys that keep things short. Um, but thank you very much and welcome aboard, ma'am. And uh, we'll go ahead and we'll pick up right where we left off. Mr. Penley? So you stole her back. Yes. <laughs> I know. Yeah, that's why. I know. We're, we're, yeah. What, what, what is uh, we're very excited about that, too. <laughs> so um, I think I had just uh, got to the building setbacks. Yes, sir. So um, depending on whether you're on the front side or rear of this development, 
Uh, the setback that is required is between 10 and 50 feet. The minimum setback that we provide anywhere is 174 feet. Uh, the others uh, ex exceed the uh, requirements by a significant amount. And this, uh, this site is surrounded by agricultural uses on every side and uh, Taylor Road over to the, to the east of the site. Um, here is an aerial. You can see right in the middle of the aerial is the site. Uh, the the uh, road that is highlighted in red on the north side of the map or straight up is uh, State Road 64. State Road 70 is in red at the bottom. And on the, um, to the east of that or to the right is a yellow highlighted road. That is Wachula Road. At this point, I'm going to ask for James Hugglestone from uh, Folly Bryant to give you a quick overview of the uh, site plan. Uh, good afternoon. I'm James Hugglestone, um, a Sarasota County resident with Folly Bryant Architecture. Um, and you have been sworn in. Yes, I have been sworn in. Yes. Uh, as you can see here, this is the site plan, uh, which is only a portion of the, uh, uh, the part of the land within the land use agreement. Uh, the site plan here, you can see the entrance coming in from the east uh, of the property along the south corner. Uh, you're coming into the uh, property, uh, there's a uh, small, like around 3,500 square foot uh, classroom building. Uh, it's, it's a masonry uh, CMU block structure with a holocore roof um, that is uh, directly uh, in front of a, a parking area uh, on stabilized ground for, and we have a stabilized parking uh, adjacent for any additional uh, uh, use. Uh, we do have a future area for um, uh, some, uh, some practice areas for law, law enforcement on the outside for the future. Um, but the, the primary purpose for this property is uh, the shoot house and the driving course. On the left-hand side, you can see the driver awareness pad uh, that's out there, and that meets the requirements for the schooling uh, for the uh, students at MTC. And then to the north of the building, you see uh, a uh, long-range and short-range shooting area that also complies. Between the two is the uh, covered uh, practice shooting area where, where Mr. Penley mentioned that there was going to be no action, live action used inside of that, but that's a practice facility underneath a uh, small uh, pre-engineered metal building structure. You can go to the next slide. Is that me? Yes. Um, uh, here you can see a slight zoom out of this area. So on the right-hand side, you can see Taylor Road. Uh, traveling northwest at a slight angle, and you see the access road cutting across uh, to the property along the uh, south. Uh, and I th believe the, uh, th there's a property line immediately adjacent to the south of the, the access road going across. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So the future, uh, the future areas that James spoke about, um, back, let me back up one slide. He, he said there's two areas to the right of the building that are future law enforcement training areas. Those are for an obstacle course, like you'll have wooden things that they climb on and stuff like that. So it's not, it's not another shooting range or anything to that, uh, to that level. Um, your, your staff report lists a number of policies and uh, addresses how we comply. I'd like to point out several of those for you. The first is policy 2.1.2.7, which is appropriate timing. And um, the, this area in the, the county consists of agricultural uses. Now there's some large tract residential uses across Taylor Road to the east. Uh, but even the staff report points out that the closest residence is approximately 3,000 feet away. So we've tried to locate this in an area of the county where we believe it would minimize the impact. Uh, policy 2.6.1.1 is compatibility and it addresses uh, whether or not uh, we meet the setbacks and the height requirements and density or intensity. I told you earlier how we meet all of those requirements. We have generous setbacks. Uh, we're a one-story building and have a very low FAR. Policy 12.1.2.3 um, addresses whether or not a public school is allowed in this future land use category. 
future, um, sorry, public schools are allowed within the agricultural rural uh, future land use category according to your comprehensive plan. And finally, policy 12.1.3.2 uh, says that new and, uh, new and proposed school sites should be compatible with the anticipated uses in the area or the adjacent or on the adjacent properties. Again, this area is currently developed as agriculture. There's no large developments proposed out here in this area. And, um, you know, we've worked with the city to locate this here. I, I will tell you that there is an existing range on the property just to the north of this. That range has been here since approximately 2005, according to your staff report. And um, so we believe that we're compatible in that regard. Uh, one of the gentlemen also said that uh, he was concerned about Taylor Road being dirt. It's actually shell. Uh, I will tell you that that is on, the last time I checked, it was on your Rural Roads Improvement Program. I think it was listed in 2028, but not positive about the year, but it is a road that is programmed for improvement. Um, and we, we located this on the south edge of the property so that if by chance there were a stray bullet. Now I'll tell you, these are these are law enforcement officers and law enforcement trainees that will be out here. It's not open to the public, but if by chance a bullet got outside the burned area, which is 15 feet on the back, um, we're providing about 6,400 feet. Actually, I think it's more than that, uh, but we'll say 6,400 feet to the nearest residence to the north. So we have over a mile. So we wanted to locate it here so that it would protect any surrounding residential to the north. And that residential is not in a direct line of fire to the north. It is more off to the, uh, what would be the east. Um, with that, I'll open it up to any questions that you may have. All right, thank you, Ms. Penley. Um, I'm on the board, just a couple quick questions. What are, the, what are the hours of operation of this school? Would it be just during the day, you know, 8.30 to 5, or are there any night training out, night shooting out there for for the students that will be attending the Law Enforcement Academy at MTC? Uh, I have the Law Enforcement Director here from Manti Technical College. His name is Jay Romine. I'm going to ask Jay to respond to that for you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Appreciate uh, the time to spend before you. My name is Jay Romine. I'm the Director of the Law Enforcement Academy at MTC. I'm a Manatee County resident, and I have been sworn. We run two academies a year for basic recruits. Uh, normally about 25 students per class. Um, their hours during the day are from 7 a.m. to 3.30 in the afternoon. They would only actually be on the property for their firearms training between those two classes total for a total of four weeks out of the entire year. The firearm block is 80 hours, so they're there for two solid weeks. 90% of that is daytime shooting. We do have a, an evening shoot where we have that, but we would certainly be good neighbors and be cognizant of the fact that we don't want to be making a lot of noise at night out there. Uh, we will do the minimum that we have to do under low light conditions to meet the qualification standards for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. So that is only uh, a total of 160 hours a year for the Basic Recruit Academy. As far as our driving uh, operation goes, that's a 48-hour block of instruction. So that's a little over two weeks out of the course of the year. Uh, we would do a, uh, I know there's some concerns about the noise with that. I will tell you that because of that concern, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement has recently changed the rule in the program where they no longer require the use of sirens in the driving training where they used to. And they did get a lot of complaints from the neighborhoods about the siren noise. So at the request of the training centers, they did uh, adjust that rule. Uh, we do not anticipate even using sirens in our basic recruit training. The vehicle training will create very little noise, very little uh, impact on the area. Uh, we don't do any weekends. Everything is done during the day, and the vast majority of it would happen between 7 o'clock in the morning and 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, another quick question. Um, the range, the, sh the shooting range and driving training, are they done at the same time or at different, different intervals? They're done at different inter intervals during the course of the academy. They're scheduled at different times, yes, sir. Okay. Um, is, anybody, is anyone else going to be allowed to use this range outside of MTC? We are looking at opening it up to some of the local agencies if they would like to use it on a fee-based schedule because, quite honestly, right now, 
We have nothing in the area. This has been a need of the agencies for many, many years. Uh, as far as the academy goes, right now what we're having to do, we had an indoor range on our old West Campus on 34th Street for many years uh, until because of unsafe conditions inside and air handler quality issues, it was shut down. Ever since then, we've had to be uh, going to shoot straight and paying shoot straight. They've been good with us about it, but that's that's a civilian <laughs> range. Cheap. It's not really set up. No, it is not cheap, and it's not really set up for tactical training. And obviously the city of Bradenton, who has been shooting out there and has been using it since about 2005, 2006, will continue to do that as well. Uh, as far as our driving goes, we have to go rent the driving pad at St. Pete College when we go up there, which is even more expensive than renting Shoot Street to do that, which is the reason why we want to have our own facility to do that. We really don't know right now what the interest from the other agencies are going to be, but I would say their biggest interest is probably going to be in the driving pad and doing remedial training because that's what the cops do all day long. They drive. <laughs> and uh, a lot of times because of limited facilities, you go through the academy and get your driver training, you may spend the next 20 or 25 years in your career and never have an opportunity to train again. And we have far too many officers and deputies that are being killed and severely injured in on-duty car crashes. So uh, I do anticipate them using that, but again, that's going to that's gonna be very little impact on the area and on the facility itself. But it's a, it's a huge boom to law enforcement in Manatee County, and it can be to everybody's benefit. In a time to where I'm sure you all know there's never been a time in our history, I've been in this business now for, uh, this is my 44th year, and it's, uh, I've never seen a time where quality training is more important for our law enforcement people, and this would give us an opportunity to do that. All right, thank you, sir. Appreciate your answers. Um, Commissioner Turner's on the board. Yeah, I think in the presentation, we, we covered the, the comp plan and the zoning questions from the constituents. Uh, one of their other concerns was the location. I think you may have touched on it. You know, if we go further north, uh, we're getting closer to residents, which a straight bullet would become more of a concern. Can you address that, though, directly? Yeah, let me look up that measurement because I did take a look at that before I came here today. So um, I was correct. Yeah, we are currently the firing line is 6,400 feet from the nearest residential unit to the north. Um, that is on Faulkner's property. It's migrant housing, my, migrant workforce housing. So if we were to move it farther north, if you had a stray bullet, it could potentially jeopardize any residents over there. At the moment, this would be the best location that you can. Sir, that's why we located it here. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Pendling. Um, no, no, sir. No, the, uh, sorry. I mean, we can't have any chat. You, you have your opportunity to speak already, and I can't have you come back down. So uh, thank you very much. Staff, would you like to come forward and speak to this? Mr. Chair, do you yep. also just allow disclosure, explain communication? Yeah, sorry. Is there any, been ex parte regarding this? All right, thank you very much. Good afternoon, Chairman, Commissioners. Charles Andrews with staff. Um, I'm here if you have any questions. I can go through the PowerPoint, but it's pretty much what Mr. Penley and company have said about the site, so I'm, I'm here on staff side. Uh, Ag Rural Future Land Use Classification does permit public schools, as does the uh, EX Extraction Zoning District, so I'm here if you have any questions. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions, staff? Oh. I don't have any questions of staff, but at some point we'll reach where we ask questions of staff, the applicant, or members of the public. Have we reached that point yet? Well, we had public comment. Yeah, but yep. later, later on as we go through questioning, just questions for staff, questions okay. for the applicant. And then eventually, I think it's prior to discussion, is am I right, Ms. Shank, where we have an opportunity for questions of staff, applicant, or the members of the public? Yes. Okay. okay. So just when we get to that point. All I'd right, thank you. like to be on the board. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're at that point. Okay, so we there's any other questions of staff or applicant, and then you want questions of the public. So um, who would you like to call up, sir? I'd like the gentleman in the light blue shirt over here. Thank you, sir. Um, and I just, I was going to ask originally why, because I thought he brought up an interesting question, is why do they choose that front corner 
of the parcel, but I think that question, I know that question was answered by the applicant when he said that the reason was is in the event of a stray bullet, they wanted to be as far away from a residence as humanly possible, and that was how they achieved that. But it sounded like you had an additional comment to make, and I'd like to hear it. And I appreciate that because I didn't have a, the benefit of the presentation prior to my original comments. So I'll, I'll pose mine in a manner of questions for you since this is a question session. One, what protects the people using this class, since it's so close to my boundary, from the shooting and other things that are going on on our property? Because we use this property for hunting. We don't have berms or other safety devices. So this is a very, in my opinion, why do they consider this a perfect location when they're only considered about, concerned about their shooting, not anyone else's shooting around them? Second, the storage of, com of explosive materials on a site generally requires a heavy industrial zoning. The classification of this as a school is a stretch. It may be used for training purposes, but I don't believe that the purpose of this district, this, this property as, as a school zone, was really the intent of, of the way that they're interpreting the code. So the storage of explosives like bullets and other things generally requires heavy industrial zoning. It's not usually normal in a school where no firearms or explosives are allowed on the property. And, and I also would like to say that I, I think their manipulation of the lot size by leasing 70 acres so that they can build this facility legally on the site is a little bit of another manipulation of the rules. Anyway, thank you very much for my addition. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, I think that answers all of my questions. I mean, obviously the state has gun laws in place in any rural area uh, for the safe discharge of firearms that would be covered by, for all of these surrounding neighbors. Um, and also I know that schools are given, I would say great leeway when it comes to their, their land rights and their um, ability to what they can build on properties, and I'm sure this falls under that. I don't know if Mrs. Shank wants to elaborate on that point or not. I can, Mr. Chairman, if, if you'd like me to. Yes, yes, we have a school planning interlocal agreement, which was mandated by the Florida statute, as well as the limited scope of review. And basically, we can't get into how the school operates its facility. We're focusing on just what was presented, Mr. Penley, the, the consistency of the council plan, land use map, you know, is it allowable use? And we may impose reasonable development standards, but they can't relate to have hours of operation or discharge of firearms. That level of detail is up to the school facility. So we're, we're limited and consistent with the concept of plan is the primary focus. that cover your question, sir? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Um, being that we've had other questions asked, I think we should give the applicant a uh, rebuttal, correct, Madam Attorney? Yes. All right, thank you. Mr. Penley, would you like to have any rebuttal? Uh, yes, let me respond to the 70 acre uh, requirement that was brought up. Your land development code requires that we lease or acquire 70 acres. We didn't want 70 acres. We did it to comply with your land development code. We really need the 24 acres here. But again, we're within 653 acres of city property. Um, a second thing is we do have berms that are 10 feet on the side and 15 feet on the rear to prevent any stray bullets. And um, a third item that was brought up was that a school, th this is a stretch to call it a school, this is an extension of Manti Technical College. Uh, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement <coughs> acknowledges that the training facility is an extension of that. So. Um, it, it is definitely a school. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Staff, do you have any closing comment? All right. Thank you. All right. We have a uh, pending motion and looking for a motion. <coughs> yeah. Motion to approve by Commissioner Satcher, seconded by Commissioner Bearden. If you all cast your votes now. And the motion carries 
six to zero with Commissioner Ballard being absent. Thank you very much. Mr. Right. Mr. Chair, can I make a brief comment? Yes, hey, yes, sir. We have a rural road paving program where, that started before you came on uh, this board uh, where we're putting funds in every year. I can't remember the fixed amount of funds that we're putting in every year. Commissioner Cruz might remember. Something like that. And, and so the idea is because the shell quarry that was in SMR is no longer available to us, so we're having to go down to Fort Myers to get shell, and it's becoming very expensive. So we're trying to pave a certain number of roads each year to limit the amount of uh, upkeep that we're, we have on these roads. They're very spread out, the rural road, the dirt roads that we have, non-paved roads that we have. Um, and I did ask Mr. Butso, he, Taylor Road, of course, is on the list. It's on the list for 28, for 2028, but perhaps we could talk to Public Works and see about getting Taylor Road moved further up the list because of the impact this project would have. Right. So, thank, thank you, you, sir. Appreciate your comments. All right. Thank you very much. Ms. Knapp, can we read item number 11 into the record, please? Item number 11 is SSP 2401, Resolution 24-055, Parish Community High School Modification School Site Plan. It's so a resolution of the Board of County Commissioners allowing for the expansion of an existing high school, parish community, in the UF3 urban fringe land use uh, category, making a determination of consistency with the comprehensive plan for a school site plan, which includes a 24,000 square foot, one story building with 16 classrooms and related infrastructure on approximately 95 acres, um, located in the A1 Agricultural Suburban Zoning District and located at 7505 Fort Hammer Road. And again, should you need one, Charles Andrews is here for a presentation. All right, thank you, ma'am. Um, would any of the commissioners like to be pulled for any presentation? No. All right, thank you. What I do at this time is open this item up for public comment. Is there anyone in, in the audience that would like to come forward and give public comment on item 11? Seeing none, I'll close public comment and looking for anybody on the board? Any? Mr. Chair, we did no ex parte communications. Yes, ma'am. It's okay. Yes, ma'am. Any ex parte? No. No, it's. it's. Okay. All right. We have, a, we have a motion by Commissioner Satcher. <coughs> Same guys. A motion by Commissioner Satcher, second by Commissioner Turner. If we could all cast our votes now. And the motion carries six to zero with Commissioner Ballard absent. Thank you very much. We move on to the next item. This is presentation scheduled. What we'd like to do is we're going to um, open both these items together and we'll vote on them separately, but we'll hear them as one item. Ms. Knapp, can you go ahead and... Okay. Um, Ms. Knapp, can... yep. was there any ex parte? Okay, none. Thank you. Um, Ms. Knapp, can you read um, item 11? I mean, sorry, item 12 and 13 into the record, please. Yes. Item number 12 is PA 2311, Ordinance 2411, Shops at Harrison Ranch. It's a small-scale comprehensive plan and map and text amendment. Um, it's a privately initiated small-scale map amendment to the future land use map, um, land use element to designate specific real property generally located at the northwest and northeast corners of US 301 North and Harrison Ranch Boulevard from Res 3... Um, and UF3 to ROR retail office residential future land use classifications providing for a specific real uh, specific property development condition in the text of element two which would limit the maximum non-residential intensity to 300,000 square feet as may be modified pursuant to an approved land use equivalency matrix and then item number 13 PDMU 1112GR2 shops at Harrison Ranch this is amending ordinance number PDMU 1112-GR and, and the general development plan to allow the multifamily use up to 320 units in a freestanding emergency department and retaining the 300,000 square feet of non-residential uses previously approved. Also establish a land use equivalency matrix for the conversion of the commercial entitlements to the multifamily use and the freestanding emergency department. And third, approving a revised schedule of permitted and prohibited uses as voluntary profit by the applicant as attached in Exhibit B, all on approximately 30 acres, again, as described at the northeast and northwest corners of US 301 North and Harrison Ranch Boulevard. Uh, your staff presenter is, you have two different staff presenters. The plan amendment is Charlie and the, Charles Andrews, and the uh, plan development is Laura Gonzalez. Thank you. That was a lot of reading. That Thank was. you, Ms. Knapp. Appreciate that. 
Um, what we're going to do first is we'll ask the applicant to come up and address the uh, text amendment um, on item number 12. So, applicant, it's Russo. Good afternoon. All right. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, for the record, I'm Scott Rudisill. I've been sworn. I'm here on, on behalf of the applicant. Um, are, are we opening these two items together, Mr. Chairman? Yes. We're gonna, okay. All right. Well, our presentation is fairly brief. We'll hit them both. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, as Nicole mentioned, there are two requests that are before you today. Uh, the first is a comprehensive plan, future land use map amendment from the Res 3 and UF 3 categories to ROR uh, with some D5 limitations. And the second request is to amend the existing GDP for the shops at Harrison Ranch. Uh, this is our project team. Uh, we have uh, HC Properties is the, is the applicant here. Uh, we have Jeb Mulock with ZNS as our civil engineer. Uh, Margaret Tusin and Paige Estegriba with ZNS are planners on the project. Uh, Chris Kennedy from Kimley Horn is here to cover environmental. And uh, Steve Henry with Links and Associates for traffic. Uh, I want to start by giving an overview of the existing entitlements and what's being requested. So the site is currently approved for 300,000 square feet of commercial uses at a maximum height of four stories. The project has already obtained concurrency, so it has an existing CLOS. Um, Nicole read off a lot of things. It sounds like a lot of things are happening here, but the request is actually pretty limited and straightforward. The applicant is asking for the potential to convert some of that existing 300,000 square feet of commercial uses to either multifamily or to the freestanding emergency department use. And the multifamily would be limited to a maximum of 320 units over the entire project. Uh, and like I said, either of those uses, they're not in addition to the 300,000 square feet of commercial, they require a trade-off of the commercial entitlements to those to those new potential uses. And so this is an area of the site, uh, as was mentioned, it's a little over 30 acres on both the northwest and northeast corners of Harrison Ranch Boulevard and US 301. Uh, this is your future land use map for the area. Uh, you can see that there are other locations of standalone ROR, both east of and west of this site. Neither of those are at an activity node like, like, this, like this site is. Um, the site is already approved for 300,000 square feet of commercial uses, as we mentioned. So the main reason for requesting the ROR future land use category is that the FSED use is only allowed in ROR or MU. So we had to pick one of those two. Um, we picked ROR. The ROR brings with it uh, additional density, so we have capped that. Um, that's the reason for the maximum of 320 dwelling units across this total project site. Um, and you'll see that reflected in the revisions to the GDP as well when we get there. All right, this is the zoning. Uh, you can see it is existing PDMU zoning for the site. And here's a list of the, of the proposed changes. So we're asking to add that land use equivalency matrix for the potential conversion to those two uses. Um, we are removing the old references to the NCO. Uh, we're asking for the option to be able to provide some of the upland preservation off-site. Um, And that's really it in terms of what's being requested. So here's the GDP. Uh, you can see the proposed location of the FSED. That's the red box. Um, and so we wanted to highlight that being at the uh, location at the intersection there. Uh, also wanted to highlight some of the buffering that is proposed with this project. So if you look at the West Parcel, you know, there are only a couple of areas where we have any single family residential uses um, near the property. And so those are the areas where, where additional buffering is actually already being provided uh, because of the commercial uses that were approved on the site. Uh, so there, in that location, there's a 15 foot buffer. And then if you see the blue, the blue line there, 
that is a location that will be either an eight foot wall on top of a three foot berm or a 12 foot wall in that location where the blue line is. And then as we go over to the, to the east parcel, um, the dark green area is wetland preservation. You can see that is wider than the typical buffer area. Uh, the lighter green area is an upland preservation area. So this is all an area that has existing mature vegetation that is being preserved. Um, and then you'll see an area in blue along there. Um, that is where an eight foot wall is proposed in that location. Uh, there is one specific approval request for this project. Uh, the code generally requires an FSD to come before this board with a PSP. Um, this site already has an existing GDP, so it would be a little complicated for us to come forward with a PSP just for this site with having an overall GDP already in place. And so what we're asking is for specific approval for the board to approve the FS, FSED use at the GDP stage instead of coming back with the PSP. And what we have done is, again, we have limited the location to that intersection where it is away from any nearby residential uses. And so we think that that satisfies the intent of that, of that code provision. Uh, that's, that's really it. I, I did want to note the applicant has been working with county staff for some time on a potential agreement related to uh, intersection improvements here. Um, so that, that is something that is, um, that is being looked at, it is not required, but the applicants looking at this area are going, this would be good for our project, this would be good for the county, and so we're willing to look at that. And so um, that is something that is, that is in process, but obviously we have to get through this first. So. Um, that's why we're here. We're respectfully requesting your approval and happy to answer any questions. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Cruz is on the board. Thank you, sir. Sure. You, you talked about the equivalency matrix. Do we have an equivalency matrix? We do, yes. Because it wasn't in any of mine. I asked about it in the briefing. I didn't see any. I, I understand the all or nothing up to 320 residential, but that's not really an equivalency matrix. That's not saying I can give up X thousands of square feet of commercial in exchange for X number of units, like you see in a DRI. I couldn't find that any place. Okay, we do have that. Uh, hold on a second, let me see if I can get it. But, but yes, it is a... It's one of the attachments, Mr. Rudisill, to the um, item number 13. <coughs> okay, you see that. In terms of, Margaret just handed me what the actual, what the conversion is for 320 units of multifamily would require an exchange of 38,000 square feet of the of the commercial. So it's 38,000 square feet. Yeah. Go down. Okay, it doesn't exist on my screen. Yes, right there. Where? Okay, there it is. <laughs> no <laughs> All right, so in, in your equivalency, it, what's the maximum? You're saying a maximum of 320. Is, is your intention to allow for 100% of the commercial to, in theory, be traded for residential? No, not at all. No, it is, um, it, it is the, like we said, it would only, it would only require 38,000 square feet of commercial to be traded to achieve the 320 units. 38,000 square feet of commercial in exchange for 320. All right. I mean, it, it sounds like to me, and I had this conversation the other day, um, when, I asked, when I asked staff why we're going ROR, because it sounded like the, the intent, uh, for all intents and purposes, was you wanted to create the freestanding emergency, that, and, and you can only do that in that zone. So the request is, can I have the highest possible zoning the county has so I can build this one specific structure. Right. But the property itself is R3, right? That, that, that's what it well, is. three and you have three. So yes. in theory, this property is for 90 residential units based on its current zoning, based on the, the map. In 2012, you got it bumped to 170,000 square feet of commercial. 
So effectively, you traded 90 units for 170,000 square feet, and then you got it bumped again to 300,000 square feet. So you traded 90 theoretical developable units for 300,000 square feet okay. of commercial. I'm just saying on a per on a, on a per unit basis, it seems like now you're trading 38,000 square feet for 320 units. That seems like an excessive amount of units for nothing. Because it, it here's the problem: if you just would have built the the 90 units, you could have done that as of right. Over the course of the last couple of boards sitting here, you've you've traded the residential for a lot of commercial, and the other boards. And I wasn't here; none of us were here for those boards. Even the 2019, none of us were here. There's no commercial up there, or there's a lack of commercial up there. I hear it all the time. There's no sit-down restaurants. There's things that we need. People want commercial. So previous boards, and I can't look into their minds, probably said, we'll give you more commercial than you probably warranted for the zoning because we need the commercial up there, and that's a fair trade. We don't need as much residential. We need more commercial. So you got an outsized amount of commercial, and now we're kind of washing it backwards saying, well, let me trade some of this excess commercial you gave me to build excess residential, which is above. You're not trying to cap yourself at the 90 units you were allowed. It seems like you, you took advantage of getting more commercial because it was need, and now we're trading it back for more. I, I'm just trying to figure this out. If, if all you want is the emergency unit, we can have that discussion. But it seems like by going ROI, ROR, we're opening up a Pandora's box of allowable uses above and beyond what the real intent of this site was back when you got the approvals that you're trading. Well, well, let me talk about the density a little bit. So this is a mixed use project at an activity node. So if this is UF3. Oh, well, it's at, not. It's R3. It's a combination of UF3 it one and acre R3, of UF3 right? in the top okay. corner. Yes. So at UF3, that would let you go up to nine units to the acre for mixed use, I believe, at an activity node. Somebody checked my math there. But which would be 270 units. Um, Res 3, I don't know if there's a density bonus, um, but the density that's proposed is not, ROR will let you go up to 32 units to the acre here. What we've proposed comes out to, I think, 10.7, something like that. So we're well below what ROR would allow. So it really was, it was requested for the FSED, but we, they are getting a lot of interest for multifamily in this location. Um, I think it would be a good use for this site. Um, it is planned for mixed use, and so they said, you know, we should do that here um, when we come in for this request. And, and there was no other way around. Like, here, here's my problem. I, I hate continuously trading. We did this with Artisan Lakes. They got they. It was a DRI. It was a little different. They had a real matrix, and they eventually they said, "Hey, this is going to be a walkable mixed-use community with commercial in the front." They traded all their commercial. Was it last year, year before, for more residential because that's the easy thing to build right now. That's the popular thing to build. That's where the profit is right now. No one's looking at what the impact to the community is going to be ten years from now when you have no commercial and everyone has to get in a car and drive forty-five minutes to get to a restaurant that's not a pizza place in Parish. So, you know, so you're trading long-term viability of a community for short-term gain by trading commercial for residential. And again, we saw the Artisan Lakes. We've seen that down in, in Heritage Harbor and these places that have matrixes, and we were stuck with it because they were matrixes. Here, we don't really have a matrix. You're proposing to add a matrix after the fact and trade needed commercial for theoretically less needed residential and somehow bump an R3 up to R10 and and try to claim that's really low density because in theory it could be R32 based upon a, de a zoning that doesn't actually exist. So you're asking for zoning and then proffering you're going to take less density than allowable even though it's more density than you're actually allowed in exchange for it. I'm just saying, you know, I'd rather have the commercial in there and figure out a way of allowing the, the freestanding. I know people have, come, uh, have, have had issues with the, the emergency because of the ambulances and so forth. But that said, we we put fire you know fire stations directly around residential as well. I mean, mm -hmm. I understand that noise. It's not it's not perfect, but you know, and for the sake of discussion, I'd rather have that. I'm just not as open to giving such high density residential because you're saying it's not near residential, but it is. It's the entryway to a massive community, and that massive community is now going to have what you're trading thirty eight thousand square feet. So you're still going to have over two hundred and fifty thousand square feet of commercial plus three hundred and twenty up up to three hundred and twenty residential units right at the entryway to Harrison Ranch, which is already going to become a thoroughfare all the way up because we're connecting that road even further up. I mean, that's you know, I feel like we're having the same discussion that a previous board had with Terra when people wanted to build commercial all in front of that 
that and then put a bridge that cut over to, to Honoré afterward, and it would destroy the, the, the nature and the character of that entire neighborhood. I feel like you're trying to cram 10 pounds of stuff into a five pound sack just because we can take advantage of an ROR zoning that it doesn't currently have. So I'm just saying, have you thought about any way of just getting the freestanding emergency center as opposed to changing to this zoning, which then opens up all this additional use? Uh, no, that, that was not something that was considered. Again, the, the impetus for the ROR was to get the freestanding emergency department. No, but now it seems like once we give the ROR, now there's other things you can conveniently do because the impetus turned into an opportunity above and beyond the actual impetus of just getting the freestanding emergency. If that's the case, then you wouldn't be asking for anything more than the 300,000 square feet of commercial, which you're already granted right now. You'd just be trying to come up with a matrix to trade some square footage of the commercial for the emergency in an ROR and proffering that's all you were going to do. So it's, it's not really just the impetus for one thing. It's an opportunity for other things. We Yes, we did want to leave it open for that because there is, we're responding to the market and there is a... I, a I know, but it. we had this conversation. We, we terminated, we, we, we declined a deal, I think, twice out on Elcon where someone came and, and asked for a very high additional density above and beyond what they had. And we declined it because we said that's a huge jump in additional density surrounded by residential. We need to see a better handle on what you're going to build. You're not really proposing any more of what you're going to build here, and I get it, that's cost prohibitive, but this is a big jump. I, mean, I feel like we should be afforded more information other than a map with a, a blue line that shows this is where a buffer is if you're going to try to get that much additional density on this site. That's just my opinion. I was curious if you did look into other alternatives other than ROR, but it sounds like we didn't or it wasn't possible. Right. I mean, the only other alternative would be MU, so. Okay. Thank you, sir. Are there any other questions for the applicant? Seeing none. Staff, you're up. Thank you, Charles. Good afternoon, Chairman, Commissioners. Hi, Charles Andrews with staff. So this is the shops at Harrison Ranch. Uh, the applicant did a great job of summarizing what their request is for, so I'll be brief on this. Uh, Property is located 301 and uh, Harrison Ranch Boulevard there on the north side. Comprise of 30 acres. Uh, it, it is currently UF3 and uh, Res3, excuse me. Proposals for RR. Uh, there's a breakdown here of what the entitlements look like on the existing future land uses. And then the proposed. And this request does come with a D5 provision or a specific area limitation. Uh, maximum 320 units, dwelling units, uh, or 300,000 square feet. Uh, nearby projects, uh, the site surrounded by the Harrison Ranch uh, subdivision, uh, Silver Leaf to the south. Uh, compatibility, we've got uh, currently a Res 3 around it uh, with UF 3 there. Uh, positive aspects of the request, the property is located west of the uh, future development area boundary, or FDAB, and it'd be considered infill development. Uh, development would result in an activity node where the principal arterial and urban collector intersect. That's Harrison Ranch Boulevard and US 301 North. Uh, the RR future land use classification does allow for mixed use, uh, mixed use at a development which would help serve uh, nearby residents and visitors to the county and allow for internal tri vehicular trip capture. Uh, the RR also allows uh, different housing types than the established single family neighborhoods for prospective residents. Uh, let's see here. Uh, a few negative aspects here. So the RR potentially allows for residential development to be established within the activity node without a commercial component. So there isn't a, a minimum requirement on that. Uh, the RR future land use potentially allows greater density than surrounding single family residential communities that have been established. Uh, development of the subject property could therefore be significantly higher than adjacent residences as well as more active than could be established under the Res 3 and UF3 classifications. Uh, the utilization of the loom uh, does not directly limit the amount of potential density or intensity that could be constructed on either side of Harrison Ranch Boulevard. Uh, mitigating factors, so the D5 provision that's being offered up or proffered by the applicant limits both residential and non-residential development, like I said, to not exceed 320 dwelling units uh, or 300,000 square feet in accordance with the loom. Comprehensive Plan Policy 2.6.1.1 uh, 
Uh, it has an application for development order. It proposes a use intensity, height, and or density that could not be found, that could be found to be incompatible with the use on the adjacent site, shall utilize techniques to mitigate potential incompatible characteristics of the proposed use. Those techniques include buffering, screening, setbacks, innovative site design, et cetera. Uh, in summary, uh, the request appears to meet the applicable policies of the LDC and the comprehensive plan. And we are here to answer any questions on the plan amendment. My colleague, uh, Laura Gonzalez, is here to present on the rezone. Commissioner Cruz. Oh, you just didn't take me off. No, well, the system's not allowing me to do that yet. Commissioner Turner. Yes, yeah, so as I understand it, um, you know, the exchange, the rules around the exchange, it's not the applicants or the attorney making those rules. That's us, right? 38,000 square feet for 320 units. Uh, so great, great, great question, Commissioner. So that is the loom that I believe, Laura, you could speak to that a little bit more on that regarding the trade-off mechanism, but that's something that we have worked on with the applicant on that, on the, on the staff side. But it's not them creating it because I was, I was led, I was starting to believe maybe they're creating it by George Cruz's comments. We create it. Chair, uh, yep. Normally, it has to do with trip generation. Right. What they're giving up doesn't generate any more trips than what they're adding. So okay. Not, so the neutral in terms of impact. So there's a there's a matrix set by us. Okay. Um, Nelson Galeano, Transportation Planning Staff. Um, I have been served. Let me let me clarify uh, two issues or several issues about the land use equivalent matrices. Um, the idea of the land use equivalent matrix is to provide flexibility um, in terms of the type of uses that they are exchanged by means of the number of trips. Okay. It means there are a threshold with the number of trips and certain number of daring units, for example, equals in number of trips to uh, a square feet commercial. And that is the trade-off uh, uh, that we have. This is the trip generation, but we express them in terms of um, uh, uh, daily units or a square feet commercial or another, but we don't speak essentially on the land use equivalent matrix about trips. Uh, the land use equivalent matrix works with uh, trip neutrality. And when I say trip neutrality, it is about the number of trips, not the type of trips. And this is a heavy difference. Um, we can have, um, um, for example, 100 trips. Um, but if these 100 trips are short trips, uh, really these trips make less impact on the roadway network. But the, but the same 100 trips are longer, uh, they congest more because, because the, the, the destination is farther. Uh, and that is, the, that is the, the main concern when we speak about uh, land use equivalency matrix. This is right when, when we have the same number of trips, but we need to drive half hour more to get a restaurant or to get a fresh tomato. Okay, okay. so it's well thought through. We got it. Yeah, I got it. Um, so this is an activity node, and this board has uh, it gives an allowance and an activity node for uh, higher density. And so then we've got this exchange. I mean, it, it seems to me like it's a, it's a well thought out request. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have one quick question. Um, the applicant mentioned uh, intersection improvements. I don't know if it's Charles or Nelson. What what do you see are the intersection improvements that need to be hap happen right there at 301 in Harrison? I mean, I. It's, uh, again, Nelson Galeano, transportation planning. Since uh, this is a land use equivalent matrix, uh, in terms of trips, there are no change, and for that reason, there are no analysis on any intersection because we preserve the number of trips. We, we don't overhaul any threshold, and, and, and this type of analysis is not needed for, for this type of um, um, application of the land use equivalent matrices. All right. Thank you, sir. Oh, um, Commissioner Satcher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think it's probably for Charles. So, in this application, we're talking about 320 residential units. Is that correct? That's correct. So, 10.6 dwelling units per gross acre. Yes, sir. 10.6. Yes, but sir. then the overall uh, 
you know, classification they're looking at is what, ROR? Is that right? ROR with a D5, which would limit it based essentially to 320 dwelling units, which would be 10.6. If it was just, if they were to come to us and ask for straight ROR, what would what would be the max on the residential so only apartment be units or something along those lines? 30. Hold on. Got a calculator. Hold on. Give me one second. So it would be... So it'd be 32 at 30. Is that 960 units? 30 at 32 dwelling units? Yeah. And then, so to your knowledge, if you're on a state road, all right, and maybe this is, maybe I should just state this in deliberations. Um, I mean, you've got two roads right there. They're making improvements, like it or not. It's looking to connect up to Moxon Wallow like it or not, I try to play the best I can with the hand I'm dealt. What argument would a future board or this board be able to make to keep that from going ROR and then getting 32 units per acre if, if the board didn't want that? I can't think of any. I'll just go ahead and say that. I can't think of any good arguments. So, I mean, the fact that they're limiting it in their application to 10 might not be any of us. I mean, I live there. Okay, so I mean, this is where you know I shop of 1.5 miles away. Um, so does the rest of Parish and Ellington. Um, I can't think of, you know, what would be if I can't stop altogether everyone from moving to Florida, which we know is not possible. How are we going to do better than this? Especially given when we mentioned Tara earlier. But we lost that case in court. The county lost that case in court with Tara, correct? I mean, we ended up spending millions of dollars because, um, you know, the developer there sued us and said we had no right to deny some of the development that they had asked for, and it cost us money. I mean, not just money. I mean, they still could have done it. So I don't know that I see the arguments, and I also... What did you say? The, the ROR normal top per acre is what? An activity note would be 32, Commissioner. 32. Dwelling units, yes. Yes, sir. And what was the math on it? Oh, 960. 960. 32 at 30 acres, yes, and sir. They're coming to us with 320, is that correct? Yes, sir. And they're already approved at what, 280, 240, something like that? It's, let's see here. So, I mean, this is an increase, but it's nowhere near the increase that they could go for. And going with the arguments that I've heard from commissioners in the past, I don't see how um, we would end up. How are we going to win that in court if we uh, were to go against them getting OR, ROR in the future? I'll just say it. We would lose, and it wouldn't have the votes. It would get approved straight out. And in this case, we're, there's a freestanding ER, correct, that they're proposing in this? That is what they're proposing. That, that's uh, why they were looking to go to RR, yes, sir. And perhaps, once again, it should go to deliberations, but I know the time of the trip from 301. Um, to get all the way to Manatee Memorial. And I've had discussions behind the scenes, exhaustive discussions with our public safety about how I can improve the time for one of my citizens to get to somewhere to give them the care that they need and save their life. We've got a 12-foot berm. We're limited at 320, um, which is less than 100 more than they are already at. Um, and we have no argument to... Um, to keep them from going for almost a thousand in the future, and we, I wouldn't. And there's only two of us up here from Parish. We would not have the votes to keep them from anyone from go, doing that later. I do not believe. To me, this is a great offer um, for the people of of Parish. It's not. Um, it is not perfect, but it is. But I'm kind of relieved of what I'm looking at today. Thank you, sir. To make a comment, sir. Thank you, sir. Are you back? You on back? Are you back on the board? Yeah, just uh, well. I just wanted to make an additional comment. If okay, you're back on the board. Okay. Um, I'm in agreement with uh, one thing that Commissioner Cruz said that there is a need for commercial space, and I'm used to seeing red shirts in the audience, and you guys are nodding about the the commercial space. This is a, a compromise because we'll still have over 250,000 square feet of commercial space available. So. Um, there, there is that aspect of it, but I'm, I'm in agreement. It looks like constituents are concerned about a lack of commercial space, but this does not delete at all. So we can have that. We can have that in deliberation. 
Any other questions for, for staff? Thank you very much. Thank you. What we'll do now is we'll open up for public comment. I have one speaker on item 12. Sorry, Chairman. Uh, we do have Laura Gonzalez for the oh, reason. Oh, I'm side. sorry. Apologies. I forgot you were over there. I apologize. <laughs> sorry, Laura. We'll hold public comment after Laura. <laughs> Denise Grew for staff. I was also going to say that um, I'm not exactly sure what um, discussions they were in, but I do know Scott May at Public Works had discussed a traffic signal at US 301 and Harrison Ranch Boulevard, and maybe some turn lane improvements. So. All right. Thank you, ma'am. All right, Laura, you're up. Sorry about that. Okay. Good afternoon. This is Laura Gonzalez with Development Services, and I have been sworn. I just want to emphasize some aspect of this proposal. The primary changes introduced by this mm, GDP amendment involve the inclusion of residential uses and the freestanding emergency department to this commercial development that was approved in 2012, and also the establishment of a land use equivalency metrics to facilitate the exchange of existing commercial entitlements. This is the GDP. Uh, the West Parcel is proposed for commercial and multifamily residential uses. The East Parcel is designated for commercial uses, including a self-storage facility that was approved, and the, free standing, the potential freestanding emergency department. The current entitlements approved are uh, total 300,000 300, square feet, uh, including the 100,000 square feet of the self storage building that was approved on the East Parcel. The proposed additional uses are up to 320 multifamily units and up to 19,000 square feet of the freestanding emergency department, subject to a change of the commercial entitlements in accordance with the land use equivalency metrics. The use of the land use equivalence and matrix ensures that the number of trips associated with the new mix of the uses does not exceed the approved number of trips for this development. If the development use is, is um, if the multifamily use is developed on the West Parcel, potential compatibility issues could affect the single family uses adjacent to the development especially those to the northeastern side of the West Parcel property line. To address this issue and provide separation from the multifamily building, the GDP proposed buffers with variable width depending on the proposed use. In addition, along the northeast property line of the West Parcel adjacent to the single family subdivision, a 15-foot wide screening buffer with a decorative wall as explained by the applicant and shown on the, in the GDP uh, will be provided and it has been stipulated in the ordinance. Landscaping will be planted on the exterior side of the wall. The GDP also proposes minimum setbacks per use and in addition, sorry, in addition to the proposed buffer and setbacks, the commercial development on the east parcel is separated from the residential single family use to the north with a stone water facility and a wetland preservation area. The maximum height that is proposed is four stories, four stories as the maximum height approved for the commercial uses. The building height compatibility section of the code will be met. Uh, the applicant has requested specific approval to allow the proposed freestanding emergency department to be approved through this hearing process with a general development plan instead of a preliminary site plan as required by, co by code. This request is consistent with the previous approval of the development, a GDP that was approved in 2012 and amended, amended in 2019. The process allows for its review and approval by the board and at time of the final site plan, the project will be reviewed for compliance with the design standard for the freestanding emergency that is contained in LDC section 531.62. The proposal meets the commercial locational criteria subject to the comprehensive plan amendment 
approval, the project will be located with, within the ROR future land use category and adjacent to thoroughfares. With the proposed stipulation and related specific approval, and based on the analysis presented in the staff report, staff finds the request to be consistent with the policies of the comprehensive plan and the applicable requirements of the Land Development Code, subject to co the comprehensive plan amendment presented today. Compliant with these standards and requirements, we'll be reviewing in detail, in, in detail at time of the preliminary site plan, final site plan. Any questions? All right, thank you. Is there any questions of staff on the rezone request? All right, thank you very much. Okay. Appreciate it. What we'll do is we'll open up for public comment. I, uh, I'm going to bring everybody forward for public comment on both items. First up is uh, Afra Wade. I'm Afra Wade, reside in Manatee County, and I've been sworn in. The parcels in question border our homes, villas in Normandy West and Normandy East. I'm asking for a vote of no for the rezoning, even according to some of the paperwork from Manatee County's own staff, quote, that changing the FLUC to ROR is not complimentary and supportive of the existing nearby area. If you took plans of a house and built it in several areas of Manatee County, each one would have a different value. Why? Location, location, location. I'm asking each of you to take into consideration where our homes are located. Harrison Ranch has become the area to move to, so please help us to keep our homes in that desirable location. In one of the documents filed, there were comments and points between Dan Greenberg and ZNS. Mr. Greenberg, quote, why did the applicant have the pre-application review process waived? Again, quote, unfortunately, that pre-application review process likely would have helped to generate comments and the potential for discussion related to the proposed FLUC change prior to the formal review process. Unquote. We should have had a neighborhood meeting to ask questions and voice our concerns. This shows no respect for or care for the constituents of parish. In the section on urban sprawl, it says we do not need a freestanding ER because a hospital has been approved for parish, possibly two. How are the resources protected when asphalt is covering so much of the ground needed to keep natural systems in place? A clear separation needs to be in place between these two parcels and our homes. In the 2019 approval by the board, it says commercial structures shall be a maximum of four stories. There was no approval of residential units being four stories. If you view parish, there are no four-story buildings. And where there are apartments, none border residential single-family homes and villas. Also, the title, Shops at Harrison Ranch, doesn't that convey boutiques, eateries, small businesses? We have been an established neighborhood since 2007. Consideration for our safety, traffic congestion, equity in our homes, and the environment, including wildlife, needs to be a major point in the process of review. This application for rezoning has too many ands, ors, additions, deletions. What is really the end game? Should the developer make a profit? Isn't that the American way? But at the expense of the residents of Harrison Ranch, especially Normandy East and Normandy West, which are gated communities, I respectfully request a no vote for the rezoning. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next up is Jackie Hepler. Ma'am, please state your name, county residence, and you'll have three minutes. And that you have been sworn. Hi, my name is Jackie Hepler. I'm a Manatee County resident, and I have been sworn in. Um, I want to thank the builders for um, at least addressing some of the issues that they heard last week from us, and that they made clear a few things. I also want to thank Mr. Cruz for expressing our concerns in Harrison Ranch as far as the the shops at Harrison Ranch because you are right on there that's exactly what we expected um, a safety issues that's still questionable I mean you've come up and said there may be lights there may be you know different uh, intersection improvements but that is not for sure um, the endangered bald eagle we have a cell tower with a bald eagle's nest in there that's been in there, I don't know, for, probably since it's been established. Um, one of the things is that 
they and other wildlife will be further endangered by the destruction of these habitats. Contaminants from the construction runoff will go directly into our backyards and into the lake that provides the food source for the eagles. Um, have they looked into any laws against buildings so close to the eagle's nest? Has that been addressed? Um, again, what Offer said, there was no neighborhood meeting, and, and so it was showing no respect for the people that live there, especially Normandy East, Normandy West, where we live. Um, our Normandy West is mostly comprised of senior citizens, retirees who've invested their whole life savings into a quiet community. An apartment complex along with an emergency in front of our community means increased hurried traffic and ambulance sirens at all hours of the day and night. And again, we are under the impression that there have been approved two hospitals in Parish, uh, one at Fort Hamer and uh, Moccasin Wallow and another one at the end of Moccasin Wallow in 75. Why would you not put an emergency room right there so there's comprehensive care for an emergency like that. In closing, the commissioners are taxed with the well-beings of the citizens they represent. We implore you to consider this proposal plan to amend the shops at Harrison Ranch. We understand that vacant land implies eventual development, but please consider the residents who live there that are impacted before voting on this extreme plan. We are counting on the con commissioner board to protect the current residents of Normandy East Normandy West, and the totality of Harrison Ranch. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next up is Susan uh, Galbraith. Ma'am, please state your name, county residence, and that you have been sworn, and you have three minutes. Good afternoon. My name is Susan Galbraith. I live in Manatee County in Harrison Ranch, and I have been sworn in. Um, you repeatedly have talked about the off-site ER, and we were told at the last meeting that there will be no traffic uh, impact on our development, none whatsoever. But yet, federal law yields the right of way to emergency vehicles at all times when operating sirens or flashing lights. They, their entrance is near the entrance of Harrison Ranch. That is going to impact, impact the residents of Harrison Ranch going to and from our residents. Um, average number of patients that are seen in an emergency room in a 12-hour shift is approximately 40. And since this is an emergency room, not an, emer not an urgent care, we will have mean transportation by ambulances all the time coming in and out. We have families that have that work and they have children. The sirens are going to keep these keep people up at night when they and so this is something I hope you would consider. I've also been told that there is a standalone emergency room on the docket to be built on the corner of Moccasin Wallow and 301. That's seven and a half miles from where we are. Why does one have to be built right there in the residential area? The one on Moccasin Wallow and 301, there's no residents around it whatsoever currently. Um, another one uh, that I brought, I'm sorry, I get nervous. Um, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Our development where I live is on Normandy West. We are not a 55 and older community, but that is the majority of, of us who live there. We have invested our income into this final home for ourselves, and now you're asking us to put up with an emergency room, a four-story potential apartment behind my home. It's gonna be about maybe 50 yards, 75 yards from my house. And uh, what I'm also concerned about is it, I'm not gonna have any privacy anymore. Uh, windows, lights, noise, all of that. They'll be able to look in the back of my home, lights at night, I'm not gonna be, you know, be shining into the back of my home. These are all things that need to be considered and need, need to be, um, that you need to look at. Please look at us as the, of the residents that live there. The last meeting, it was brought up, why did you not have a community meeting to let the residents of Harrison Ranch know what's going on? A comment was made as, 
We didn't think you would be that upset about what's being built behind your homes. We are residents of Parish. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate your comments. Next up is Gary Zakur. Is that? Sorry about butchering your name. Mine gets butchered. Oh, too. no, that's okay. Everybody does. Please state your name, Love county you. residents, and you have been sworn. You have three minutes, sir. Uh, my name is Gary Zacker. I'm Manatee County resident, and I have been sworn. Um, I sat through the last meeting. I don't normally get involved with any of these things. I would just say this. Before I moved to Harrison Ranch and before it was finished, I live in Normandy East. I live right behind where the warehouse is going. The builders told us we would have commercial buildings out front. To help, you know, restaurants and that kind of things. Now it's all changed, which is understandable. But now you want to put 320 apartment people out there? We pay a CDD fee to maintain our trails and our property. And now you're going to let them people just come walk all over our property and our trails for nothing? That's not fair to us. It's not fair to my people that are here with me. I, I just can't see how this is legal. To do this I understand the need for emergency care or whatever but like they said a hospital has been approved two and a half miles away three miles away um, but that's basically all I have to say I mean I pay a lot of money each each one of us pay a lot of money in taxes for our CD DD property and the little wall that they built doesn't even cover the the pond that we pay to maintain um, I'm sorry, but that's all I have to say. And Mr. Cruz, I'd like to thank you for your comments because you were right on. Thank you, sir. Next up is Nancy Edmonds. Please state your name, county residence, and you have three minutes, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Nancy Aloy Edmonds, and I'm. I want to mess up your name. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of vowels. Um, but I'm a, ma a resident of Manatee County, specifically in Normandy West, which is going to abut this development, and uh, my home is going to be impacted in a very serious way. And you have been sworn, correct, ma'am? I have been sworn. Thank you. Uh, my husband and I purchased in 2022, uh, so we've only been there a few years. And um, at that time, we were told that this property would be commercial, and again, it's still entitled The Shops, at Harrison Ranch. Um, and there's nothing um, related to a shop, so the, the still calling in that, that is, is um, hysterical to me. Mr. Cruz, I really appreciate your comments. I think you uh, nailed the, the concerns, the agitation of the people who have invested our retirement savings into living into a nice, quiet community, and this, the rug is really being pulled out from under us. Um, at this point, again, I reiterate, you know, I, I'd like to know, and I understand this isn't a question and answer period, but how were our rights to a community meeting waived without any notification to the 1,100 families that live in Harrison Ranch? The greater majority of those people don't even know about this meeting today or what is being proposed. Um, after Mr. Turner's comments and Mr. Satcher's comments, I, I fear that this is going to be approved without any further discussion, even though the plans are shaky at best. They, they aren't very specific. They're kind of vague. And um, we, we feel that it's going to be improved in a, it approved in a, um, in a manner that's just not giving it thorough consideration. I don't understand the nature of these matrices and these trips that you're talking about. I don't know how an additional 320 homes, let's say there's a minimum of 400 cars coming from those homes, is not going to impact our community. I don't understand how sirens and ambulances aren't going to impact the number of trips in our community. I don't understand how that intersection isn't going to become more of a nightmare for us than it already is. Harrison Ranch Boulevard is a public access road. So there is traffic there day and night, uh, congestion uh, coming in and out of, of uh, both ends, especially at, at uh, 301. We listened to the discussion about the shooting range and how it would impact a few homes there. The congestion, the noise, 
of this proposal isn't just going to affect a few people. It's going to affect all 1,100 of us, but especially the 99 people who live directly up against this proposed development. It won't just affect us a few weeks a year, like the shooting range. It's going to affect us 365 days a year, 24-7. If, may I just say one more thing? Yes, ma'am. Please finish your thought um, quickly. I'll, I'll make it very brief. With, I, I suspect you're going to approve this. That's my greatest fear. But could you complete, please um, address the buffers and the walls? A four-story four building against our little villas isn't going to be very helpful. All right. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you. All right. Seeing that there are no other speakers and no one is on the board, um, so what we'll do is we'll applicant rebuttal. Scott, would you please um, reference the lack of a community meeting and give us a little, just reiterate detail on buffers and walls, please. Yeah, uh, I'll do that. And thank you, Mr. Chairman or Commissioner. Sorry, questions of what? No, questions are fine. Sorry, I meant to say questions and of staff and applicant and civilians. No, I appreciate that. Um, I got something. So let, let me hit on that first then. The reason we didn't have a neighborhood workshop, I mean, I think somebody mentioned it. This is a site that's already approved for 300,000 square feet of commercial uses at four stories. And so going to allow the option for multifamily, multifamily is typically um, viewed as being more compatible with other residential uses than commercial. So it's like a, it's like a down zoning going from commercial uses to multifamily, and so we didn't anticipate um, that that there would be a lot of pushback on this. Um, so that that was the reason that we didn't have the the neighborhood workshop. Um, we just we just didn't anticipate that that it was going to be um, that there were going to be this level of concerns going from existing approved commercial to uh, other residential types. Um, the, I, I want to circle back on a couple of things that were asked before. Uh, the, we checked in the staff report the total maximum number of units that are allowed under the current conference of plan category is 183. So that would be the max that would currently be allowed. So it's not like it's not like there's no residential or 90 units. It could go up to potentially 183 just under the Res 3 and, and UF 3 that's there. Um, going back to Commissioner Turner's comments, you're correct. We don't we don't create these um, these land use matrices and how the the trips are traded off. There's a there's a standardized manual called the ITE manual that is utilized to determine how those trips are, are analyzed. And so our consultant puts that together. The county reviews it and approves it, and that's how and that's how the numbers are established. Um, I wanna I wanna go back to something that Commissioner Satcher brought up. And if we could pull up our, our presentation, I apologize. All right, thank you. So there was a comment about, about the ROR, and we didn't really get into this much at the beginning. Um, but this is an area, when this area was originally planned, Harrison Ranch Boulevard was not a thought in anyone's mind, right? So that's why when you look at this area and you go, oh, well, this is, you know, you got res three here, like, well, you know, what was going on? Like I said, no planned thoroughfare road coming through the middle of this site at the time. The only other location in this area along 301 where you have an intersection of a major arterial in US 301 and a full intersection with a planned thoroughfare coming through like we have here, future four lane Harrison Ranch Boulevard, the only other location like that is Old Tampa Road. And at that location, the entire intersection is ROR with no limitations. So the, the point I'm trying to make is this, is this is a 
site that has changed dramatically since this area was planned. The infrastructure that's going in place here now completely supports uh, beyond what we're asking for here, but what we're asking for with this request is very appropriate, particularly in light of the entitlements that already exist on this site. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions that the, uh, that the commission may have, but we're asking for your approval. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there other questions of, a, of the board? No. Okay. That brings staff up. Oh. oh, yes, sir. I, I did not address uh, Commissioner Van Austin Bridges questions on the buffers. So let me go back to that. Okay, so this is the buffers we're talking about on the west side, and you can see where the lots are um, in the communities that we're talking about here. So the the area where the blue line is, there is a there's a 15 foot buffer. And then the area of the blue line is there is there will either be a three foot berm with an eight foot wall on top of it or a 12 foot wall in that location. I know people mentioned a little berm and a little wall. That's the biggest buffer that I've ever had um, installed on a project. I mean, that that's a tall buffer. Um, on the eastern boundary. Uh, the dark green area is wetland preservation, existing mature vegetation in there, along with an eight-foot wall in the blue along the, the northern boundary of that, of that stormwater pond there. And then, you know, further to the east is the um, native upland preservation area. Again, existing mature vegetation that's, that's being preserved in that area, wider than the required buffer. Excuse me, Mr. Russo, real quick. Um, I just had a quick question. One of the, one of the uh, citizens brought up the impact of light, noise, other things um, intruding on their, um, their units. Can you address uh, what the code requires or what you guys have to submit regarding no intrusion of light or sound or on and how far actually your setbacks are going to be from the nearest, the nearest uh, residents? Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of the light, uh, I mean, we're required, there are very strict requirements in Mantee County as to light spillover. And so obviously we're going to be required to comply with all of those requirements. Um, same thing related to noise going off site to residential areas. Uh, typically you worry about that with commercial. That's not what they're complaining about here. But, um, but yes, so we will be required to comply with all of the lighting and noise re uh, requirements related to those uses. With regards to one of the uh, citizens concerned about um, folks in these units on a four-story building being able to look into their, to their unit, can you um, explain how far back your setbacks are going to be for line of sight for the residents that are abutting this property? Um, let's see, because if we do, and obviously four stories is the max that we could go up to. We don't even know if it's going to be a four-story product or not at this point. Um, if it is four-story, um, there are additional setbacks that are required for height com compatibility under the code. Uh, I think it's an additional 20 feet in addition to what would typically be required. So um, with a 15 foot buffer and then you would have typically a 15 foot rear that would go to 35 with that. So you'd be at a minimum of 55 feet. I'm just doing the math in my head now um, between the property line. Um, let me let me put something else up real quick just to see if you can pull that up. All right, I don't know if you can see that or if you can zoom in on it, but this kind of this shows um, the the entrance into Normandy West and the existing uh, canopy trees that exist there along their property boundary, and so that would be if you. Then we're going to go to the overhead here, right? Mm -hmm. So you see the trees are located along their boundary. Then you're going to have a 15-foot buffer on that side before you get to the berm and wall that would be located in that area. So you, you're going to have a 25 to 30-foot wide vegetated buffer before you even get to the berm and wall. Okay, thank you. Ms. Knapp. Uh, yes, thank you. I just wanted to um, ask that the applicant speak to um, 
there were some statements made from the public about the, the, the function of the uh, freestanding emergency department and if you could speak to their ambulatory service and um, you hear the term that they're coming in hot, meaning the sirens are running at what times of the day, if you could speak to that. Also the trips and the estimates of where the trips are going to be coming from. I, it, on your GDP you show the freestanding emergency department at the uh, far southwest corner of the east side. And then lastly, if you could also state for the record, um, signs and mail notices were meet state statute. Uh, yes, we, uh, I'll start with that. We, we provided a, an affidavit certifying that all the notices for the meeting met all of the county's requirements for, for notice. If, if that's, is that what you're asking for notice for the meetings? Correct. Thank you. Yes. Um, in terms of the in terms of the freestanding emergency department um, this is not this is not a facility that they anticipate a large volume of ambulance traffic coming into and the ambulance traffic that is coming in they're not they're not having lights and sirens on doing donuts around the parking lot there they they don't need them once they once they are getting to the facility, so you're talking about you might have um, you might have sirens on occasion on US 301. Well, it's a six-lane arterial road. I mean, you have that you have that potential now. And if they were going past this site to the hospital up at um, uh, up at I 75 and Robinson Gateway, I mean, you'd be you'd be at the same you'd, you'd have the same lights and sirens going, um, but. The, the expectation here, I think what they estimated for us was there might be two to four a day ambulances, and even those, the majority of them are not coming in with sirens. So, Real quick, Mr. Roussel, on, on Ms. Knapp's question, are you anticipating this freestanding emergency would be something like that's on US-41, like a, that's on US-41 now that um, – Manatee Memorial has, and then Blake's building one also. It'd be that type of facility. Yes, that that's there's exactly. ambulance on it, but they really get not a lot of ambulance. Right. That that's exactly what's anticipated. Similar to what's being proposed, 75th Street West. What's on US 41? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Are there any further questions from any of the members? All right. Thank you. All right. <coughs> Staff, do you got any closing comments or anything like that? Mr. Russo, you're good? Okay, so what we do is we want to um, go to item one. I don't know if we're call item, one. 12. item 12, sorry about that. The first item, which we talked about. Which item. And looking for a motion to approve the. Sorry, you're not on the board yet? I think somebody else is on the board. I'm trying to get. Yeah, you're on the board. All right, Mr. Cruz. Commissioner? Yeah, I just. I want to make sure it's clear. I mean, we can vote however you want. That's the that's the, the pro and con of, of coming in front of this board. We can literally rezone anything to virtually anything, and so this board can make that decision on whether or not this is an appropriate rezone. But let's at least be upfront with what is it. This is currently R3. Okay, there's a sliver that's UF3, but if for all intents and purposes, it's R3. And they basically use neighborhood commercial to get some commercial space for the benefit of a neighborhood to allow for a mixed community. However, being R3, we, we talked about a lot of things earlier today. R3 doesn't have commercial, no designations and things like that to, to get bonuses. R3 doesn't have mixed use bonuses. It, you could do some affordable, you can go from R3 to R6 if you wanna put affordable workforce housing in there, but you're not getting all these other bonuses while it's R3. And to say, well, they're really giving us a benefit here because they could build 906. No, they can't. It's R3. They can build 90 units and then go up to 180, whatever, including the little sliver UF3, if they do affordable housing density. Hard stop. That's what they can do based on the current zoning. They are here today to ask our permission to change the zoning above and beyond what the future land use map says they're allowed, which we're allowed to do. I'm not faulting anybody that's that's what you're allowed to do but let's not say we're going to get sued if we don't give them 900 units you're not going to get sued nobody at no point in time are they showing up in court saying that they had a reasonable expected equitable return on 900 units on this parcel of land that they rezoned twice already to get to 300,000 square feet of commercial it's still r3 there's no path from r3 to ror other than asking permission 
that they, th this is not an as of right rezone. This is not something you're gonna get sued for. It's R3 and they can use it as they see fit with R3. And I think this county and previous boards have been pretty generous in terms of the modifications for, for the commercial piece. Now that's my, but so let's be honest about what this is. This is a straight up rezone to increase the density and usability of this site. And we've done it before. And it, seemingly we're gonna do it again, but let's be honest about what this is. I'm okay, I know they don't like the, the ambulances, I don't have a problem with that. I, I'm okay with that. And if that really is the, the reason behind this discussion, you could say ROR and proffer that there won't be a commercial co or a residential component to it and you'll get what you want. And you could take your matrix with your trip counts and convert whatever amount of square footage of commercial into the, the ambulatory care you know, emergency center. And we'll call it a day because that's what we're being told is what you really want. But since we're giving you ROR, you're gonna take a little more. That part I just disagree with. I think this piece needs commercial. I think this space has come twice in good faith to ask for a commercial and this board or previous boards twice has honored a request in good faith to you. And now it's kind of being taken advantage of since previous boards honored a request that now we're gonna come up with a new matrix to get a little bit more out of it just because that's the hot top, the hot thing right now is multifamily. So I disagree with the request. I don't disagree with the emergency center. I, I don't like the fact that we're feeling we're feeling obligated to increase to ROR from from R3. We're just not. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Satcher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, I just want to say you know that I appreciate everyone coming here today. Um, it's good to see. A lot of friendly folks, and uh, that's what's great about living here in Manatee County, and specifically District 1. It's the best. Um, I want to just speak a little bit to our role as commissioners. I got an um, email just last week uh, that went on uh, paragraph after paragraph talking about th how upset they were with the commission. I am with me specifically. Um, and one of the big things was, you know, what we need in our area. And they went on about how we need a sit-down steak restaurant that's a nice place to go. Um, and then went through kind of a litany of things that we need to see more of in uh, Parish. And I just want people to understand that we don't decide what someone's going to do. It's not a command economy, right? So someone owns the land, they come to us and basically this is what they're planning on doing. And there's, there are restrictions on what we can and cannot uh, you know, reject them doing. So I, my wife, loves good steak. I want steak restaurants, whoever might be listening out there, bring us a nice steak restaurant. You know, um, That's what I want. But I don't get to decide that. What I get to decide is what's in front of me and how it relates to the law and with precedent that's been set for this community and for the business community. So to say, I, I do think it's important that we're true, that we're truthful. I have been consistent with people that own land in our area. I have said that I know good and well that it's not all gonna be farms. I love riding horses, I love being on the farm. Um, that is, you know, my happy place. I can't, there's no way in the United States of America where we have land rights, thank goodness we do, right? So I'm not saying, I can't keep people from developing their land or from moving here. So I've set out pretty consistent vision. I've said, if you can bring me res three, I'll approve it all day long. So if you do three homes per acre, I'll approve it all day long because I feel like that is reasonable return for someone that owns land um, and it gives us a nice place. Now, people that have spoken previously uh, have said, well, that's urban sprawl. Well, those same people live in a res three neighborhood. So I try to be upfront with people. If res three, a neighborhood where everybody has a third of an acre on average, and of course you have set aside you know, for environmental, but if that's the, if that's res sprawl, then give me residential sprawl. Because I would much rather, I would rather live on a 100 acre farm, but next to that, give me at least res three. So there's nothing wrong with that. I've said that consistently to developers, and that's how they can get my vote. The other thing is, I know good and well from experience up here on this board 
that I have to be reasonable when it comes to multifamily developments. Why do I know that? Because my very first meeting on Erie Road in the curve of the road, the, one of the most dangerous spots in all of District 1, the person that's sitting here telling me that I'm not telling the truth, he voted for, for them to go and increase their entitlements on that curve, to go up on that curve. I voted against it. I was the only one against it. So it was a 6-1 vote. A couple of weeks ago on Ellington Gillette Road, who takes, the, I, I take the back way pretty often, I take Ellington Gillette. Someone came up here, they wanted entitlements, they wanted more improvements, and they wanted to put a residential or a multifamily development right off of Ellington Gillette Road. Well, my concern is traffic and safety. I lost the vote six to one, six. So look and see who voted against me. Six to one, and the person said, well, you know, this is infill. You tell me, you live in District One, you tell me how much infill is going on in Ellington Gillette Road. Is that an urban center, Ellington Gillette Road? It's not. So I just want to identify what's going on. I try to be consistent, which does not mean that I can be everyone's friend all the time. I try to go by the rules I'm given, which does not mean I can always do what everyone wants. And I try to judge based on what's given to me. I don't get to decide what they bring to me. They're bringing to me this project. I hope they change their mind and they do some wonderful shops and we have a great place. Uh, you know, I mean, boy, right down the road at Old Tampa is busy. There's nowhere to park. You better believe I'm calling Benderson and, uh, multiple times asking them to come up with more parking because it's very popular. So I hope they change their mind and I hope it does stay commercial. But if it doesn't, I don't have a basis in fact and looking back at the history to deny this proposal. And once again, I have multiple times behind the scenes, I'm arguing continuously to get us better response times for people that are sick in our, you know, that have a medical emergency. So um, for me to do that, for me to be as straightforward as I am with staff to say, y'all need to figure this out. That's, I've said that and much more behind the scenes, okay? For me to do that and then to say, you know what, I'm going to turn this down. I, I can't, I can't, you know, leave here and feel like I'm consistent if I were to do that. Uh, so for that reason, even though it's not fun, um, especially with people that I see and, and work with at Publix, um, I'll be voting, you know, I'll have to vote for this. I don't have any good argument not to. Neither does someone else who's told you all their great arguments when they said the exact opposite thing two weeks ago. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. All right, we have a motion on the board, uh, a moved by uh, Commissioner Van Ossenbridge and seconded by Commissioner Bearden. If you'll cast your votes now. The motion carries five to one with uh, Commissioner Cruz as a no and Commissioner Ballard being absent. Uh, we're going to move to um, item 13. Uh, Mr. Chair, yes. a quick point of order. I yes. uh, just wanted to inform commissioners that the Longboat Pass Bridge that connects Anna Maria to Longboat Key uh, was stuck in the up position for about an hour, and I just got a text that it, it ha that FDOT has it working again. The bridge is down, but it was blocked both directions for about an hour. Uh, and if you haven't been out to the Barrier Islands or visited District 3 recently, I would just say, happy spring break. <laughs> <laughs> so. All right. It's a true statement. It's a tough day for that. <laughs> All right. We, um, we have... <laughs> you want it right now? I know, but I'm just going to look. We're almost done. Oh, no, I got a long one. You have oh. item 13? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get there, but I'm being... I'm being interrupted, so I'll, I'll, we'll do a recess here in a second. Um, item 13, um, there's a motion on the board looking for motion on, has been moved by Commissioner Van Ossenbridge, seconded by Commissioner Turner. Catch your votes now. The motion carries five to one with Commissioner Cruz voting no, and Commissioner Ballard is absent. What we'll do is we'll go, we'll do a break till 350.
Uh, you go for that, Mr. Commissioner Ryan Bridge? All right, thank you. We're in recess till 3.50.
Thank you very much. And we're back to finish the rest of our land use meeting. Seeing there's no one there, no other citizen comments. <laughs> Ms. Shank, you have anything else that you'd like to add? No, sir. All right, the, um, there is no county administrator up here. Ms. Knapp had to go upstairs. So we're going to move on to con con commissioner agenda items. Um, the only item I have left, and then we'll go to other commissioners, um, is the um, addendum or amendment to County Administrator Bishop's contract. The, um, I think everyone's been briefed by uh, our HR department on this. What we wanted to do was to bring, commission, to bring Administrator Bishop's salary equal to what the county attorney is making also, and I did a lot of research, and basically we're his, uh, moving him up to the 229,000 is pretty consistent with um, the county of our size uh, around the state. And um, the other items that were to be brought forward as a amendment to or addendum to his con amendment to his contract were items that were left off his contract. Um, previously, that should have been in his contract. So um, I know we're going to have some discussion on this. So um, if, I don't know if we need to go to the board or, or just chime in or whatever, but I think we're pretty just the rest of us up here. So um, I'll just go. Are there any comment from any uh, on the amendment to Administrator Bishop's contract and his increase in annual salary? Yeah. I'm, I am getting there. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner Cruz. Yeah, a couple questions. One, I, I found it odd the way it was. I mean, I didn't know about it until Kate said, oh, by the way, at the tail end of an after-hours phone call on Monday when we were talking about Pam's contract, she said, oh, by the way, you're going to get another contract show up on Thursday. That's the first I heard about this. In the past, we've usually had discussion here and directed the chair to negotiate if we're doing something with Pam, doing something with Charlie the first time. You know, we, we, we direct that renegotiation. We, we negotiated a contract just six months ago with the current county administrator, and it's up for review once a year and we typically do a full review and he gets graded on it and then he gets his salary adjusted. That's how the contract works. If we would have negotiated Pam's contract at 215,000, I don't think we would have had the authority to lower his pay. So this is one directional. So it was a little concerning that this came out of nowhere without so much discussion because at the end of the day, he's, he's, we have two employees. He's one seventh of my employee and I wasn't aware that he was renegotiating his contract. He didn't. I didn't even get a heads up of him popping in the office saying, "Hey, just by the way, I'm I'm talking to the chair about modifying my contract." It would have been nice for a little bit of a heads up and input with one of my employees. The second question is if the intent is to tie him to a county attorney's salary, even though they're two wholly separate jobs, we could run into this issue in six months because their raises are different. Because Charlie Bishop's raise is the cost of living adjustment that the rest of the staff gets per the contract, whereas the county attorney is a state mandated raise that is tied to the percentage raise of the Board of County Commissioner salary. So come October of this year, their salaries may deviate once again. Are we going to then step in and modify salaries outside of the scope of the state requirement for the raises for, for the attorney and, and for the cost of living for staff for Charlie. I mean, is the intent to put them in lockstep? If that's the case, that should be in those contracts as well because they are going to deviate. If our salaries go up 6% this year and the cost of living adjustment to staff is only 4%, those salaries are not going to match up six months from now. So, you know, I, I didn't like the process just because I wasn't aware of the process. I don't think I don't think nine thousand dollars is making or breaking anybody, honestly. And Charlie's been working hard. It's just I didn't like the process, and I don't think moving somebody up just because somebody else negotiated a better deal is how contracts typically work because it wouldn't have went the other direction. So uh, I'm not a big fan of of how it happened. But again, at nine thousand dollars, Charlie has been working extremely hard since he got here. I'm not. Adverse, so I'm not going to vote no on it. Um, I just wish the process was better in the future, and I had a little bit more dialogue and access to one of my employees. Thank you, sir. Um, no, I, I appreciate your comments, and, and um, I can understand some, a lot of it. Um, you know, we have um, 
Administrator Bishop, who, I mean, alone, his historical knowledge of what goes on at this county, to me, um, is worth a significant, you know, where we need to take him. Um, I'm not trying to match to match to match to match, because like you said, everybody's, everybody's is different, and I don't think that would be the case six months from now. Um, but I do feel strongly that, you know, um, Administrator Bishop is, you know, w worth the salary that, uh, that, we, he's, that we're requesting. And the process did come together pretty quickly. I know that the other items on the amendment he had been working with, uh, then the county attorney, Clegg on to put this back into the, back into the contract and it never got to that position, and it's here today. And these items should have been in his contract when he was made county administrator. <laughs> Excuse me. And I feel that being left out, I mean, for example, he was using a, a county vehicle just to go back and forth to home and without, didn't have a car lounge or anything, and the clerk's office uh, took 3100 bucks out of his paycheck <laughs> because he, the contract did not specify the use of a county vehicle, and he basically was using it back and forth to work. So I think that was started some of this conversation, how to get his contract to, to a position of where it should have been at the very beginning. So that's Commissioner Van Osbridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, not feeling the need to bloviate or hear the sound of my own voice, I'm just going to make a motion to approve the amended contract for County Administrator Charlie Bishop. Okay. I second that motion. Okay. Clerk. Got some motion out there, clerk. Okay, we'll go. <laughs> There's been a, there has been a motion made. Oh, there we are. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. There we go. All right. So the motion was moved by Commissioner Van Osterbridge, second by Commissioner Turner. Um, would you please cast your votes now? Motion carries six to zero with Commissioner Ballard absent. All right, um, Commissioner Van Ossenbridge, you said you had something that you wanted to bring forward. Excuse me, Mr. Well, Chair, also you have your letter about LECOM. Yeah, I'm gonna let, um, you wanna go to the commissioner, you wanna do it under commissioner comments? I'll do it under commissioner comments, All right, yes, great. sir. All right, thank you. Okay, um, let's see, commissioner comments. All right, um, my, commis my commissioner comments are basically good deals um, we have last year we also we uh, gave support to the budget for LECOM that was being submitted to the governor's office this letter is just exactly the same one as we uh, did last year and just support of the uh, budget as being presented to um, the governor's office uh, for LECOM that's all it is so I wanted to bring it last year we brought it before the board and I thought it was proper to bring it before the board this time so all I need is just I guess a motion to Move the letter forward to support LECOM. Motion to move it. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, we have a motion by Commissioner Turner. Turner and a second by Commissioner Bearden to authorize me to move, send a letter in support of LECOM's budget to the governor's office. All right, They're up on the board, so... Would you cast your votes now? Thank you very much. The motion carries six to zero with Commissioner Ballard being absent. Commissioner Van Ossenbridge. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, you, you know, we're all, I assume we're all going home watching the news every night and we're seeing essentially an invasion of the country, uh, including military aged men at our southern border. And eventually this, this wave of illegal aliens, some, to some extent, is going to make it into Manatee County. We know that the Biden administration is, is literally transporting people, with the help I've learned of Catholic Charities, is transporting people throughout the country and placing them in cities and towns throughout the country. Most of them sanctuary cities who are inviting them, thankfully. But there, there is no doubt that not everyone is being um, essentially made contact with slash you know, caught as they're coming across the border, and even when they do, uh, they're, they're released. 
these folks are going to make their way as a wave throughout the, the country. And eventually people are going to make it, if they haven't already, into Manatee County. There's been a, a lack of control at the border for decades, essentially. And we don't really know here what exactly the impact in this county has been to taxpayers and what the anticipated impact is to this county to taxpayers. So and in addition to what has been made, you know, an asylum process that has essentially been made a mockery, we now have a lot of unrest in Haiti. And you're going to have legitimate asylum claims coming forward for people who are legitimately at risk and fear of violence in their home country wanting to come forward and come to this, and come to this country. And this is the nearest state for them. Um, Commissioner Satcher can speak at length to, to Haiti as he did, um, he did work there. Um, so what I would like to do is I would like for us to direct the chair to, to call a special meeting, to schedule a special meeting and sometime in April to give people an opportunity to prepare presentations. But I'd like to call a special meeting of this board to address, and I would like it to be a meeting because perhaps there is action that can be taken and that can be, maybe not, but perhaps there is action that can be taken uh, at that time. But I would, I would like the, the chair to invite the school board representatives so that they can come in and talk about the, the burden on their system. And I would like them to invite the sheriff in. Crime is down and that's great, but what are, what is the sheriff dealing with? How is it impacting his budget, his deputy's ability to do their job? Is, is there added violent crime? Is there any added crime whatsoever? And I would like him to come speak to a CPS, to the CPS aspect of it as well. Uh, and I would like the state attorney to be invited. I think he should come in and talk about how it could be adding caseloads, you know, additional burden, additional resources being taken from his department. And I also think we should invite the mayor of Bradenton and the mayor of Palmetto to come in and talk about impacts on their cities. Both of them have police departments um, as well. So that's essentially what I'm asking. I'm asking for a special meeting where each of those separate agencies and governments come in, talk to us, explain to us the impacts that are, that are being felt and they're being had, uh, the additional burdens that are being placed on them so that we can evaluate with our staff and amongst ourselves if anything can be done, what can be done, and if it's simply only things that can be done are at the state level, then, then I think that should be added to our state priority list and that we should start reaching out to the, to the state, asking them for whatever help we think that it is that we need and any resor additional resources that we feel that we need to help with this. That's, that's my request. Okay. No, I, I think it's a great idea. Um, it's impacting, uh, all, you know, we're seeing it impact other places in the <coughs> state of Florida. Um, would you want to bring in any state or federal folks at that meeting? Um, like, would you want to bring in... Um, immigrate NIS or bring in bring in ICE yeah or, I, or you know ICE or something like that or if other commissioners want that that's fine I leave that to the chair I mean you're you're in charge of the meetings that but my essentially my request is that we bring in school board reps sheriff's department state attorney Bradenton and Palmetto mayors and then of course our staff should present you know from the county level I think our department heads or administrators should come in and present to us any burdens that we're taking on from our level. Is, is, is that a motion that you'd like to make? Yes, I would like to make a motion to direct the chair to schedule a special meeting for a date to be determined in April with the single agenda item of the impacts of illegal immigration on Manatee County. All right. Do we have a second? Yeah, Jason, second. Oh. Yeah, I second. Okay, you second it? Okay. Is there any discussion amongst the board? None needed. Could, it, how, we have a work session on what April second or something. That doesn't seem like a whole day work session. Yeah, I can, I'll, what I could do is I'll get with the county administrator and figure out if what that. I mean, yeah, it looks like it's only a quick work session. I mean, but you want it to be an actual physical meeting where if there action needed to be taken. Yeah, I think we should have the option for. I'm not saying we should take action, but I think we should at least have the option to take action in the yeah. meeting, depending on how the meeting goes. I mean, yeah, because I guess about you know. Um, but I think we need to allow enough time for the sheriff, the school board, the state attorney, for all these folks yeah. to, to be able okay. to compile a, a, a quality presentation that they can come in and deliver to us. Okay. Um, I see um, Andy's there, so I know he's taking notes. I did ask Mr. Butterfield to come yeah, down. Yeah, I see he's there, so I know he's taking notes. So. Sort of his wheelhouse. All right, so we had a, a, we had a motion by Commissioner Van Austin Bridge to um, direct the chair to hold a special meeting uh, of the – Board of County Commissioners with all of our other agencies, including the school board, the mayor of Palmetto, the mayor of the um, city of Bradenton, to discuss uh, the problem with the illegal illegals coming into our county. Um, and it was seconded by uh, Commissioner Bearden. So if you cast your votes now. 
Yeah, I will. Is there anyone like public comment? Seeing none, I'll close public comment. Um, cast your votes now. Thank you. It carried six to zero with Commissioner Ballard being absent. And thank you, sir, for bringing thank that you, forward. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, is there any other commissioners have any other comments they'd like to make? Commissioner Cruz. You good? Commissioner Turner. No, sir. Mr. Bearden. Mr. Satcher. All right. I'm good. I know. Hold on. He's going to give him a minute. Yeah. We'll wait. Hang on. <laughs> We're waiting. You good? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm waiting. His finger was moving, so I was, he was moving his mouth, so I was getting a little nervous there. Uh, and it was, uh, of course, Commissioner B uh, Ballard is absent. We wish her the best. With that, we stand adjourned. <laughs>